I'm afraid that concludes uh, questions, and I apologise to the members we have not reached. We turn to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12857 in the name of Gavin Brown on Scotland's economy and finances. I'll allow a few seconds for members to change places. Can I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons and I call on Gavin Brown to speak to and move the motion 14 minutes or so, Mr Brown. Deputy Presiding Officer, thank you. Can I begin by moving the motion in my name and saying that the Scottish Conservatives today want to have a focused and analytical debate on the subject, specifically on the issue of full fiscal autonomy and the likely effect of that on the economy and public finances of Scotland. Since September, the Scottish Government have had a very clear stance on this issue. They want full fiscal autonomy and they want it as soon as possible. Mr Swinney said in this chamber two short weeks ago, three short weeks ago, I believe that Scotland should be fully responsible for raising and spending all its own resources. So there's three reasons why we want this debate today, Deputy Presiding Officer. Firstly, we don't think anywhere near enough attention has been given to an issue that would represent a fundamental change to Scotland. And it could be a potential reality if the Scottish Government is in a position of influence in the coming months. Secondly, Presiding Officer, we want this debate because a number of experts have suggested that we would be worse off under full fiscal autonomy, not just slightly worse off, but markedly worse off with some frightening figures out there from independent experts. We've seen these figures from people who are against full fiscal autonomy. That may be expected. But we've seen it from people who are neutral as regards full fiscal autonomy. And this morning, we see it from somebody who is in favour of full fiscal autonomy, but has the maturity to accept and admit that there would be challenging times, particularly in the short term for Scotland, were we to go down that path. Were only the Scottish Government to be as open and candid as we heard this morning. And this is important because the entire package is being sold by the Scottish Government and the Scottish National Party at this election as the only way to end austerity. They're not saying we might be round about the same. They're not saying we might be slightly worse. They are saying we will be so much better, there will be so much better off, there will be no requirement for any spending reductions whatsoever over the course of the next Parliament. They even have the audacity to suggest that this would boost revenues available to spend by the Scottish Government. I'm happy to give way to Mr Mason. John Mason. I mean, I wonder if the member would accept the principle that this government and this party want both more powers eh, for Scotland and the best possible deal for Scotland, and we are not going to argue for a deal that makes Scotland worse off. Gavin Bray. I, I, I I, I'm not sure if, if Mr Mason simply doesn't understand the arithmetic, or is that actually an admission an admission from Mr Mason, who I have to say is a very uh, straightforward uh, character when it comes to debating, is that an admission that actually we would be worse off in Scotland were we to go for full fiscal autonomy, and therefore he is not going to argue for it, uh, which is somewhat against what his front bench will argue today and has argued over the past weeks and months. And the third reason we want this debate, Deputy Presiding Officer, because the Scottish Government have failed pr to publish any figures at all on the basic impact of our, on our finances of full fiscal autonomy. They have been able to ignore some of the more challenging questions in the wider debates on the economy we've had in here. Today, we wanted it to be specifically on that issue so we can hear straight from the Deputy First Minister what those figures are and so that we can implore him to actually publish the figures so that the people of Scotland can see in a transparent fashion what the impact would be. Some people in this country may well want full fiscal autonomy, even if it means we are markedly worse off, and that is their right. But many people will be voting on the judgment of whether or not we will be better 
or worse off. And that's where the Scottish Government, as the government uh, within this country, has a duty, a duty to publish those figures so that people can make their own decisions. So let's look at what the experts have been saying. The Institute for Fiscal Studies, independent experts, highly regarded experts, have been pretty upfront on this issue. They've looked at the reduced oil revenues due to lower price production, higher costs and tax breaks. And they've looked at what the fiscal position would be for Scotland and for the UK. So we know through JERS that the UK had a fiscal deficit of 5.6% in 1314. We know that Scotland had a fiscal deficit of 8.1%, a marked difference. But the projections from the Institute for Fiscal Studies suggest that the deficit for the UK will drop in the financial year we're about to enter to 5% and then down to 4% in 1516. For Scotland, though, under full fiscal autonomy, the de deficit would increase in the financial year we're about to go into to minus 8.6%. And it would stay there for the following year at minus 8.6%. So by the end of the financial year 1516, you could have a position where the UK has a falling deficit and a deficit of 4%, but Scotland has a rising deficit at 8.6%, more than double the United Kingdom. And that would translate, as the Institute for Fiscal Studies have said, to £7.6 billion. Pounds. £7.6 billion that would have to be plugged either by de decreasing spending, but decreasing spending over and above the trajectory of the UK government as set out in the recent budget. So it would mean every single spending reduction set out by the UK and £7.6 billion on top of it. Or if they didn't want to make £7.6 billion pounds worth of cuts, they would have to increase tax to a degree, or they would have to increase borrowing to a degree, or probably most likely a combination of all three. But I want to know, does the Scottish Government accept this figure of 7.6 billion? Because every time they have been asked, as they were again today by Neil Bibby at question time, they have ignored the question. Do they accept the 7.6 billion, or do they have an alternative figure? And if they do, will they publish it? Will they tell this chamber and the people of Scotland what they believe the deficit or the figure to be? Per perhaps, perhaps we're about to get the answer. I'll give way to Mr McKenzie. Mike McKenzie. I, I just wondered if the, in the IFS calculation that you've uh, laid out this afternoon, whether or not the, um, they'd taken into account the potential outcomes of the forthcoming UK election and how they figured that into the calculation. Gavin Brown. The, 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 I, the IFS figures are based on the projections set out by the UK government at the time of the March budget. So, no, it doesn't take into account what the makeup of the UK government will be. For the primary reason, Deputy Presiding Officer, that even the IFS at this stage do not know who the UK government is going to be um, come the election. They don't know, Deputy Presiding Officer, so of course they couldn't take into account what would have happened or what may happen. Presiding Officer, we see from Fiscal Affairs Scotland, another expert group, that in two thousand not, not at this moment, Mr Brody, 2019-20, so the, I've given you the uh, likely figure for 15-16, but let's fast forward to the end of the session of Parliament. The UK, according to Fiscal Affairs Scotland, would have a positive fiscal balance of 0.3% of GDP, but Scotland, if we were to go through full fiscal autonomy, would have a fiscal deficit of 4.3%. So the UK would be in the second year of a small surplus of just over £7 billion. Scotland would have a deficit of over £8 billion by the end of the Parliament, Deputy Presiding Officer. What would happen if we were to go for it and we were to then be hit by another fiscal shock? It would be very difficult to cope with Deputy Presiding Officer, and I repeat again, £8 billion worth of spending cuts on, cuts on top of the ones we're already uh, going to have, or tax increases or increased borrowing. Deputy Pres Presiding Officer of the Treasury uh, pointed out, um, who of course I don't uh, claim to be quite as independent as the uh, Institute for Fiscal Studies, they are part of the UK Government, but let the Scottish Government challenge their figures. They say that it will be a deficit of £7.8 in the next financial year. That will rise to £7.9 in 1819 and £8.4 in 1920, broadly in line with the estimates 
of others. Deputy Presiding Officer, we heard from a hugely respected business in this, businessman this morning, Jim McCall, who is a member of the Council of Economic Advisers and somebody who wants full fiscal autonomy. But he accepts that there would be a gap. He said in response to the BBC today, there would be a gap if you were allocating all these revenues. Yes, there would be, he said. That's a direct lift from the BBC website. Contrast that with the approach of the Scottish Government in the same article who said, Scotland already more than pays its own way. Not Scotland pays its own way, Scotland already more than pays its own way. Now, if you look at last year's JERS figures, that's not true. If you look at this year's JERS figures, that's not true. If you look at the projections for next year's JERS figures, that's not true either. And there is not a single independent respected economist or forecaster on the planet who at this stage is saying that we would more than pay our way in any of the financial years over the course of the next parliament, unless that respected economist happens to be Chick Brody, who wants to uh, give way at this stage. Chick Brody. A man of great thought. Uh, I wonder if you can explain, Mr Brown, when you're going on about these numbers, why under the CRA the adjustments in 2012-13, which fed through to 2013-14, why Scotland's, uh, up, there was an upward revision of over £600 million in estimates of spending by, Scottish, by, by Scotland, uh, uh, as uh, uh, referred to by the HMI Treasury, and yet the UK expenditure was cut by £1.9 billion. Why are we paying more and have paid more and you claim that we're not? Gavin Brown. Presiding officer, I'm not quite sure. Well, that was Chick Brody playing Sudoku with a few numbers, uh, Deputy <laughs> Presiding Officer, and, and probably nothing much more than that. So the, the Scottish Government, though, in all seriousness, and that, that's why we want this debate today, they, they have thus far, I have to say, ducked the question. They haven't put forward their own figures. They've given very opaque answers. I asked John Swinney a couple of weeks ago, does he accept that we would be worse off in the short term? And his answer was, word for word, I have set out the fact that by exercising responsibilities in accordance with the needs and priorities of the people of Scotland, we have the ability to achieve some of the improvements in economic <laughs> performance that I have set out. That was his answer to a direct question. What does that mean, Alex Johnson says? I don't know whether that means yes or no. But not only have they ducked the question, Deputy Presiding Officer, they have published document with, I have to say, a very partial analysis. If one were being cynical, they might say it was deliberately a partial analysis of some of the effects. So this is serious. They published the benefits of improved economic performance just a couple of weeks ago, giving the scenario of what they called full revenue retention. And they concluded that their analysis demonstrates that our economy would be improved and our overall impact on the economy would be increased and we could reinvest the proceeds of our successful economic policies. They missed two critical factors, Deputy Presiding Officer. First of all, they showed potential upsides if you get greater productivity, greater business investment and a boost to experts. But crucially, they missed out how they would actually go on achieving any of these things. Their policies could easily fail just as they could succeed. It's very easy to say what would happen if what they didn't demonstrate is how. And secondly, and more importantly, they only looked at one side of the profit and loss account. They looked at some potential increased revenues we might get if we grow, but in ignoring entirely the prospect that we would lose all of the Barnet consequentials, the additional £1,200 per head that we currently get in terms of public spending, they ignored it entirely as if it didn't exist. They went to the trouble of producing a computer-generated equilibrium model over a 10-year time period for total factor productivity, but they completely and blatantly ignored the basic calculations on full fiscal economy. What a contrast with two years ago when they published Scotland's balance sheet. And at that time, the Scot Scotland had a slightly lower deficit than the UK. That was for 2011-12. And John Swinney said repeatedly, in this chamber and out there in public, because we have a slightly lower deficit, this means in Scotland we could have had higher spending and lower taxation and still end up with a lower deficit than the rest of the UK. Well, if John Swinney was correct then, and he said it dozens of times, that must mean by implication that now with the higher deficit in Scotland and projected increasing deficit, that means in Scotland, if we did have full fiscal autonomy, we could have lower public spending and higher taxation and still end up 
with a higher deficit in the UK. That's why we've pushed the Scottish Government to publish the figures so that this chamber and the people of Scotland can look transparently at the numbers to see what the Scottish Government is actually planning for the people of Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on John Swinney to speak to and move Amendment 12857.2. Deputy First Minister, 10 minutes, please. Uh, Presiding officer, uh, let me begin by moving the amendment that stands in my name in the debate this afternoon. Presiding officer, Scotland requires the social and economic powers necessary to reflect the needs and the preferences of the people of Scotland and to ensure that we can enable the people of Scotland to build on the strong economic foundations that we have and to tackle some of the long-standing issues and challenges that we face as a society. Challenges that the United Kingdom system has so far failed to enable us to address. Um, let's take the issue of inequality. We have persistent inequality in our society and the efforts of this government and indeed our predecessors in trying to tackle this issue, um, which were making progress uh, for a number of years, uh, are now being halted by the policy choices made by the United Kingdom government in terms of the, uh, the burdens that have been carried by some of the poorest in our society. So it's just one example as to illustrate why we have to do something differently, because what Mr Brown essentially has argued for in his speech today is a continuation of the status quo, that we should not do anything to try to tackle or interrupt some of these deep-seated problems that exist and trouble many of us in our society. And the government wants to do something about that. That was at the heart of our, uh, the initiative around the, uh, the, the, the referendum last September. And in the aftermath of the referendum, we seek the opportunity to try to shape a better future by obtaining the, uh, the powers that would enable Scotland to build a stronger economy, a more productive economy, an economy that would enable us to deliver a level of economic performance that we would then be able to reinvest in the delivery of public services within Scotland. Now, as we... Um, if Mr Fraser lets me make a little bit of progress, I'll give way in a second. Uh, as we consider these issues um, and as we make the case, we accept the outcome of the referendum. So the proposals that we are setting out are set within the fiscal framework of the United Kingdom, where a fiscally autonomous Scotland would be operating within the fiscal and macroeconomic framework of the United Kingdom. But we would have virtual responsibility for virtually all of the taxes and the spending on almost all public services and the welfare system in Scotland. And for me, the benefits of such an approach are clear. They would enable us to build on the foundations that we have for a successful economy and to tackle some of those deep-seated issues that we have to face. Scotland's onshore output per head is similar to the UK average, and it ranks behind only London and the South East within the United Kingdom. Where our North Sea resources are included, Scotland's output per head is over £1,600 per person higher than the UK average. We also have a higher employment rate than any other country in the United Kingdom. And for the benefit of the historical analysis of all of this, in every one of the past 34 years, Scotland has generated more in tax revenue per person than the United Kingdom as a whole. Now, I cite these facts to tackle some of the issues that Mr Brown has raised, because the inference of Mr Brown's speech is that somehow Scotland is incapable of building on these foundations to deliver a better outcome and a better future for the people of Scotland. That is the inference of Mr Brown's speech. Now, I'll give way to Mr Brown. I, I promised I'd give way to Mr Fraser as well. Gavin Brown. I certainly don't think we're incapable, Deputy Presiding Officer, but I think the Scottish Government should be candid and upfront that certainly over the course of the five-year projections that we have, it would be more challenging and we couldn't increase bond public spending. We'd have to decrease and tighten even further. Surely he should be upfront about that. I, 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 that, that's, that's not the inference I took from the speech that Mr Brown has just made because I think with the full levers, the full policy levers of independence, we could deliver on the improve on the performance that we've already delivered and I'll come on to set out some of those benefits but I'll happily give way to Mr Fraser if he wishes me to give way to him just now. I don't, he does he, yes sir. Mr Fraser. I'm, I'm grateful to Cabinet Secretary for giving way. The, the point I was simply going to make to the, to the Cabinet Secretary was this. If he's right in his analysis, if he's right to say that the Scottish Government is, is trying to create a stronger economy and trying to uh, reduce inequality, and these are all uh, laudable objectives, can he explain how a reduction of £7.6 billion per annum in the Scottish Government's budget will assist that process? 
Deputy First Minister. I'll come on to address some of those issues about how that comes about in, in a moment. But let me just go through some of the, ex the implications of the exercise of different responsibilities in Scotland since this government came to power in 2007. We've managed to increase the value of Scottish international exports by 40%. Business research and development spending has increased by 29%. Scottish productivity has moved from being 6% lower than the United Kingdom in 2007 to sitting at around the same level as the United Kingdom. So to those who say we cannot possibly, in exercising distinctive responsibility, to create a better level of economic performance, I just dispute that dismal assessment that is put forward. And if we look at the success of Scotland in terms of inward investment, despite all of the issues that were said about the fact that during the referendum nobody would want to invest in Scotland, we are ranked the first or second most attractive part of the UK for inward investment in every year since 2006. Now, as well as being able to tailor economic policy to encourage investment and job creation, full fiscal autonomy would ensure that decisions about the level and the composition of taxation and public and spending in Scotland reflected the needs and the preferences of the people and the businesses of Scotland. Now, in this respect, this point is important because what fiscal autonomy enables us to do is to take a different course of, of action. Mr Brown's charted in this debate um, a whole variety of, 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 of different numbers, but all of the analysis does not take into account the, the potential benefit of fiscal autonomy. He cited the Institute for Fiscal Studies. On the 11th of March, the Institute for Fiscal Studies said this, full fiscal autonomy would give more freedom to pursue different and perhaps better fiscal policy and to undertake the radical, politically challenging reforms that could generate additional growth. There are undoubtedly areas where existing UK policy could be improved upon. And that rather makes my point for me, that that is, in a nutshell, the opportunity of fiscal autonomy to enable us to take dis decisions which build on that different economic record that I set out a moment ago to deliver a stronger economic performance as a consequence. I'll happily give way. Jackie Bailey. The Institute for Fiscal Studies also said that there would be a £7.6 billion gap. Now, if you take the assumptions made in your second paper about the economic performance of the country, even using your best figures, you would generate £3.5 billion a year, whereas actually the gap is £7.6 billion. Where would we get the missing £4.1 billion from? But what, what Jackie Bailey just uh, passes by is the... The caveat that the Institute for Fiscal Studies put in there, that the, that the whole issue, that the, the performance of the economy can be influenced by, as a consequence of exercising these responsibilities and these levers. Now, the other point that I want to make in answering Jackie Bailey's question is about how fiscal autonomy comes about. If we look at the process whereby this parliament has acquired additional fiscal responsibilities, the additional fiscal responsibilities that have come into place Today, in Scotland, the new taxes, land and buildings transaction tax and the landfill tax, were provided for in the Calman Commission, whose proposals were published in June 2009. And they are now being implemented here in Scotland uh, a number of years later. Now, my point is not to say that that is the ideal timescale, because I think all of us would agree that's taken too long to get us from the point of conception to the point of implementation. But my point is that those, there, is a, there is a period of time during which we have to take the steps to implement new arrangements and new mechanisms. And as, we look, and, as we, and as we look also at the approach that is proposed to be taken on the Scottish rate of income tax, the approach that has been taken on the Scottish rate of income tax accepts unreservedly that there is a necessity to operate within the parameters of the fiscal framework of the United Kingdom. I'll give way to Mr. Brown. I'm grateful Kevin to him for giving me a second time. In his view, the, time, the correct timescale for independence was 18 months. What, in his view, is the correct timescale for full fiscal autonomy? Cabinet Th Secretary, you're in your last minute. Thank you, President. That inevitably would be a product of negotiation with the United Kingdom government. And that's, well, uh, well I, can, I, can, I, can, I can set out, I can set out my view all I want, but I have to accept the reality that this would take place within a negotiation with the United Kingdom. And as I look at the issues that we wrestle with around the, full, the, the fiscal framework, just for the taking forward of the Smith Commission proposals, there is a process of negotiation that we have had to go through to enable that to happen. Now, the final point that I want to, to make, Presiding Officer, is this. Um, Mr Brown has called for 
scrutiny today on this issue, and he's perfectly within his rights to ask for that. I think the people of Scotland will want scrutiny also. Of the cuts programme, the £12 billion of welfare reforms and cuts, not reforms, cuts, that the Prime Minister wants to take forward, let's, let's have some detail from Mr Brown today about the welfare cuts that people are going to be asked to judge upon on the 7th of May. And from the Labour Party, we'd like to hear the Labour Party's commit what the Order, Labour Party please. will be Cabinet doing Secretary's closing. to we must ensure him. that they fulfil the Charter of Budget Responsibility, which involves £30 billion worth of cuts that they've got to take forward. So I look forward to hearing that from these parties that have come to Parliament today and to understand the choices that people will have before the election on the 7th of May, which is between austerity and cuts from the Labour Party and the Conservatives and investment in the economy from the Scottish National Party. Thank you. And I now call on Jackie Bailey to speak to you and move Amendment 12857.1. Six minutes, please, Ms Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by moving the amendment in my name? This, of course, is another Wednesday, another debate on full fiscal autonomy and the economy. Indeed, another debate brought by the opposition parties and not by the government into their flagship policy for Scotland, raising all of its own taxes to cover our spending. But that's the choice facing the voters in Scotland at the general election, whether to retain the block grant and the Barnet formula that shares resources with Scotland from across the United Kingdom, or whether to go for full fiscal autonomy within the United Kingdom. But let's put this in context of what it would mean in reality to the people of Scotland. Now, we know the 2013 revenue accounts for Scotland showed that we would have a black hole of £4 billion in the country's finances. And that was before the dramatic slump in oil prices was taken account of. Then, for 2014-15, the black hole is forecast to grow to £6 billion. And, of course, with the recent OBR projections on oil and the changes in the UK budget, the black hole is forecast to grow to a staggering £7.6 billion, as confirmed by the IFS that SNP members have been keen to quote today. So you would either need to slash services or increase taxes by a huge amount to fill that gap. Let's look at what that would mean. A gap of seven points in a minute, a gap of 7.6 billion is 60% of our NHS budget, more than all of our schools' budget, would completely wipe out state pensions for all of Scotland's older people. But if that's not to happen, then we would face a tax bombshell of more than £1,400 for each and every one of us. Um, give way to John Mason if he'll tell me which they'll do, cut services or increase taxes. John Mason. Thank you to Jackie Bailey. I was going to refer her to the Smith Commission, which says a, as a result of a transfer of a other powers or a transfer of tax, this, neither the Scottish nor the UK budget would be any larger or any smaller. Does she not accept that principle applies? Jackie Bailey. We're talking about full fiscal autonomy here, and the record will show that there was no answer from the SNP backbencher as to what they would do to deal with that black hole. But of course, there is the suggestion that we can somehow grow ourselves out of the situation. Well, that's just fantasy economics. The SNP had to fiddle the figures in their modelling to include assumptions about the block grant continuing, which we know it wouldn't. Even if you allowed for such a gross distortion, there is still a multi-billion pound black hole at the heart of their budget, and that's using their own figures. Now, I used to think that John Swinney didn't want to talk about this because he thought the policy was somehow wrong-headed. After all, he is apparently the safe pair of hands in the SNP government, the man who's all about fiscal rectitude, the man who doesn't take risks. Well, imagine my surprise, indeed my astonishment, to find that John Swinney was the architect of this policy. He argued for it in Cabinet. He embraced it in the national conversation in 2009. It's his name on the tin. And this is a policy that has been roundly criticised by independent experts, a policy that is all about economic risk, a policy that will hurt the people of Scotland, destroy our NHS, our schools and our pensions. And make no mistake, this is a policy that builds on Tory austerity plans and gives the people of Scotland austerity max. My goodness, no wonder John Swinney doesn't want to talk about it and prefers instead to hurl insults at opposition members because attack is, of course, better than defence. 
but especially not wanting to talk about it this week when we discovered that the SNP have signed up to the same austerity plans as the Tories for 2015-16. So there you have it. For this new financial year, the people of Scotland will continue to suffer from Tory austerity if they vote for the SNP. Now, we're used to seeing the Tories and the SNP voting together on the budget, joined at the hip between 2007 to 2010 in this Scottish Parliament. But really, this is a new low because the SNP have agreed to follow to the letter Tory austerity plans for this year. And if, if, if John Swinney is slightly confused, can I refer him to his own Scottish Government website that confirms the absolute detail of that? So what we have, on the one hand, is the SNP condemning the Tories for austerity in public, but in private, they fully agree with them, sign on the dotted line to continued austerity. What hypocrisy? I give away. Cabinet Secretary. I, I genuinely don't understand the point that Jackie Bailey is making, so I wonder if she'd explain it to us. Jackie Bailey, you're approaching the so. last minute. Could I refer you to the Scottish Government's own summary, where it sets out clearly under the heading of increasing public spending, comparison of policy costings, dated March 2015, alternative spending proposal, additional spending 2015-16, Zero. So I refer you to your own website that will tell you that. So we're now in no doubt, no doubt at all. A vote for the SNP is a vote for continuing Tory austerity. The truth is that the only party promising to end Tory austerity is the Labour Party. What's been demonstrated Arthur, by please. the SNP Arthur, over the last must few you weeks Bailey finish. Is What's been demonstrated by the SNP is just how untrustworthy they are with figures. Yeah, yeah. Firstly, they deny the black hole at the heart of Scotland's finances. Then they fiddle the figures to make the position seem even better. Then they deny what the independent experts are saying and they hide their plans for continued austerity. One thing is absolutely clear. Honesty and transparency have been posted missing with this SNP gov government. So like others in the chamber, presiding officer, we believe that the SNP government needs to publish the oil and gas analytical bulletin that made a brief appearance prior to the referendum and publish an updated outlook for Scotland's public finances to take account of those recent projections. And in both cases, to do so before May 2015 so that people can judge whether or not they have something to hide. Thank you. Thank you. We now turn to the open debate to all members ensure they have pressed the request to speak buttons if they wish to speak. Speeches of six minutes, please. Linda Fabiani to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, it was interesting looking at uh, the Tory motion and the Labour amendment. What struck me was that very seldom can the Parliament ever have debated a motion and an amendment in which so many words change but so little of substance is altered. Uh, the motion from the Conservatives and, and the amendment from Labour are essentially the same. And we heard it from the opening speakers in both these Better Together allies. Scotland is too be too poor to be in a position to manage its own affairs and should accept whatever, whatever oh, macroeconomic policies and welfare provision that Westminster decides to apply. The only thing that changes between the two texts is the tone. Uh, the Tory motion says experts predict a weaker fiscal position for Scotland and Labour talks of instant and damaging consequences for Scotland's economy. It's easy to see which party drew the short straw and inherited Project Fear. Uh, but I'll tell you what, the relish with which Labour and the Tories and to some extent the Lib Dems scenario plan for bad news for Scotland is very, very sad for people that represent the people of Scotland. They never quote other small nations that do very, very well, even without the strong economic foundations that we have. And I was absolutely delighted to hear John Swinney outline what is in fact the reality and our plans to make things better. I can almost find it understandable from the Conservative Party uh, seen by voters across the UK as representing the interests of the rich and affluent. Um, but what has increasingly come home to Scots over the past year is the electoral battle between Labour and the Conservatives is dragging Labour further and further towards the Tories. 
Yes, certainly. Liz Smith. I, I thank the member for giving way. You've just uh, mentioned the electoral battle that is coming up. Do you not think that it is right and proper that the Scottish public know what the SNP statistics are on this whole issue and as yet they haven't any opportunity of finding that out? Linda Fabiani. Well, I'll tell you what, if Labour and the Tories were honest in putting across the full detail of the Treasury paper, which didn't take into account additional powers, etc., people would know better. But what people in Scotland really want to know is the extent of the welfare cuts that are coming down the line from the Conservatives and backed by Labour when they trip through the lobbies to vote with them on austerity. The banks failed in Labour's watch. Labour reached for a solution, planned austerity. But what Labour are now accepting is that that makes the poorest in society pay for the mistakes of the wealthiest. As I said, the Tories are at least a bit more honest. They openly pursue that ideological agenda and champion that approach. The OBR, seven years after the crash, was forced to conclude that of the major economies, the UK was the only country where the deficit has not been reduced by having revenue growing faster than national income. Because the UK focused most on lower spending. All of this is the latest example of the cosy consensus that operates around Westminster, with Labour, if they're in government after May, happy to have their policies measured against targets put in place by George Osborne. And can I say at this point, in relation to the SNP spending plans for this year, I've got news for the finance spokesperson of Labour. We are in 2015-16. Budgets have to be agreed in advance, subject to available resources. And whilst unionist politicians agree that Scotland should get no more than pocket money from London, we have to cut our cloth accordingly. No thanks, I'm in my last bit. I keep hearing on the radio uh, from Labour, from the Tories, from the Lib Dems, that we need, here in Scotland, the security of the bigger partner. Security of a bigger partner that other small nations who do perfectly well independently don't appear to need. It seems to be us here in Scotland who are uniquely incapable. But I'll tell you what, that security is not felt by a lot of people. It's not felt by the 145,000 households affected by this government's changes to incapacity benefit, losing about £2,000 each. That security has not felt by all the Scottish households have seen tax credits reduced this year. It's not felt by the over 100,000 people losing an average of 2,500 a year as DLA is removed. So I think people in Scotland do want to do things differently because there is a growing body of opinion proving that we don't need simply to have a growing economy to fund our welfare provision, but we need to squeeze inequality out of the system to provide a solid platform in order to grow the economy. I believe that once again, the Tories, the Lib Dems and Labour jointly, having signed up to all these cuts, are all swimming against the tide. We can do things differently. We should do things differently and better. I would like to see people across this chamber working together for the benefit of Scotland to do things better. There's even some Labour MPs in England that have called for that. How sad that Labour in Scotland haven't. Support John Swinney's amendment. Thank you. And I now call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Mike McKenzie. Fabiana, like other SNP members during the last few weeks, and no doubt over the next five weeks, uh, doesn't want to talk about full fiscal autonomy. So I shall come to that in a moment, which is the main subject uh, of the debate today. But, uh, of course, what the SNP does want to talk about, as we heard at the end of the Cabinet Secretary's uh, speech, is the alleged uh, unity of Labour and Conservatives in terms of cuts. And the Cabinet Secretary must know uh, that this, of course, is not the case. Ed Balls is saying in Scotland uh, today um, that uh, he rejects the extreme and risky plans of the Conservatives. And he's not saying anything new, because in the debate that John Swinney and all his colleagues keep referring to when there was a vote on the Charter of Budget Responsibility, Ed Balls in that speech also rejected the Chancellor's extreme and unbalanced plans. As the Institute of Fiscal Studies in a moment has pointed out, there is no agreement 
between Labour and Conservative about 30 billion of cuts. The Institute of Fiscal Studies makes clear that there is a 30 billion pound gap between the spending plans of Labour and the Conservatives in the next Parliament. And I'm sure the Conservatives will probably go around uh, uh, Scotland emphasising that, and I don't mind if they do, because quite clearly we have to rebut the central SNP allegation of this campaign, repeated over and over again, and no doubt today, that somehow Labour is signed up uh, for these uh, cuts. The reality is our proposals, as uh, I referred to in my question to the Cabinet Secretary, are for fair tax increases across the UK, rather than increased borrowing for current expenditure. That doesn't mean that we don't want increased borrowing for capital expenditure, and that's very important, and I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would agree with us uh, on that. But when it comes to current expenditure, we have specific proposals, which I mentioned in my question this afternoon, the top rate tax uh, we know about, the mansion tax for more money for the health service, the banker's bonus tax for the job and training guarantee, the changes to pension tax relief for the highest earning uh, pensioners in order for our various youth uh, pledges. So let's be absolutely clear. We can meet the fiscal mandate without uh, the cuts. We can do it over the next uh, parliament because, uh, the, 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 because the economy uh, will be growing over that uh, period. But clearly there, will, there, there may well be specific cuts in particular areas if money can be saved. But overall, there will not be the cuts that the SNP are talking about. And we have to say that loud and clear uh, on every day during the next five weeks. Now, I'll give way to Jim. Jim thank, thank Mr Chisholm for taking intervention. Will you sign up to the First Minister's proposal that the UK Government, after the next election, should uh, agree to 0.5% increase year-on-year -year in departmental public spending Welcome as an alternative to austerity? As Jim Eady knows, and this also undercuts the central charge that the SNP have been making, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, much quoted quite rightly this afternoon, has made clear that there is a much smaller gap between Labour and SNP proposals than there is between Labour and Conservative uh, proposals. So I would support uh, Labour's proposals on that with the proviso that there is a much smaller gap there uh, than the one that, uh, in fact, his colleagues say doesn't exist between Labour and the Conservatives. But we must move on for the second half of the speech to full fiscal autonomy. Gavin Brown outlined what the Institute of Fiscal Studies had said about that. The main point being that the projected deficit for the UK is 4% this year, 8.6% uh, for Scotland. Uh, that's currently filled by UK expenditure via the Barnett formula in cash term. That is equivalent to 7 pounds uh, billion. Uh, pounds. And of course, the benefits of improved uh, economic performance paper from the Scottish Government suggested on a best case scenario that 3.5 billion of tax revenues could be accrued over 10 years. So the gap would still be there and we don't need to remind people about the absurd assumption in that paper that the Barnett formula would continue. Now I've been looking very carefully and I'll listen very carefully to other SNP speakers about the varying positions of the SNP on full fiscal autonomy uh, over the last few weeks. Actually the most interesting thing was because I listened very carefully to Nicola Sturgeon's eloquent speech on Saturday, she is always eloquent. She mentioned independence four times so that, that wasn't surprising. She didn't mention full fiscal autonomy once. And uh, I think it's really interesting because she doesn't want to talk about it. When pressed on the radio, I listened carefully yesterday, she seemed to be saying, well, it's not really anything that's going to happen anytime soon. It can all, <laughs> it can, it can all come in due course. Stuart Hosey tried to say that on television today when he was pushed by Andrew Neil. John Mason's got the no detriment idea. Perhaps he should try that out with his uh, front bench colleagues. I'm not entirely sure what position John Swinney uh, was adopting uh, today. But anyway, it's, trying, it's being reformulated, and basically they don't want to talk about this for the next five weeks at all. And yet, I mean, it's supposed to be the central plank of their UK general election yeah. Yeah. manifesto. No less a person than Alex yeah. Salmond announced this uh, a yeah. few weeks ago. So the SNP are all over the place on full fiscal autonomy. But I think it's perfectly legitimate for us to say, given it's been presented as their main demand, and, and what would they do if a UK government actually offered it to them? <laughs> or oh, not yet. We'll, we'll have it in 10 years' Take time. I mean, there actually are some Conservative backbenchers in the UK Parliament who are saying give it to Scotland because they think the UK could save some money in that way. So I think it's perfectly legitimate 
for uh, opposition parties to at least have some clarity about this central uh, SNP uh, policy position over the next five weeks. So if this uh, debate achieves nothing else, could we please have that clarity uh, so that we actually know what we're talking about before May this happens? Thank you very much. And to now call Mike McKenzie to be followed by Graham Pearson. Thank you, President Officer. Gavin Brown's motion and the Labour Amendment are nothing other than the restatement of the same old arguments we've heard from the Tories and their Labour friends for many years. Their central and only proposition is that we're too wee, we're too poor and we're too stupid to manage our own affairs. The argument that we're too wee has long since been dismissed by reference to a great number of small countries that outperform us in every way this can be measured. And I reject absolutely the suggestion that we're too stupid. And I'm sure that Gavin Brown believes, as I do, that Scotland has got talented and clever people, every bit as clever and talented as those across the rest of the UK. And I reject absolutely the proposition that we're too poor to successfully embrace full fiscal autonomy. Scotland is a wealthy country with significant oil reserves, a huge renewable energy potential, abundant natural resources, and an educated and highly skilled workforce. These, certainly. I, I, thank, I thank the member for giving way. If he is so confident of all these things, why is it that you can't give us the numbers to back it up? Mike McKenzie. The, as, the cab, as the Cabinet Secretary has already outlined, the IFS predictions don't take any account of the significant opportunities that would arise if Scotland's finances were in the capable hands of John Swinney instead of the incapable hands of George Osborne. We have all the ingredients of success. And if Gavin Brown believes we're too poor, then we have to ask him the question, and I hope he'll tell us later on, perhaps, why he believes this is the case. We we'll we'll have, we'll have to ask him the question why he believes that this can never change in a second or two. We have to ask him why he's so complacent about his dismal prospectus. Gavin Brown. Brown. I don't think we're too poor at all, but I think if you look at the independent projections, we would be poorer in each of the next five years of the UK Parliament, whereas your party is saying we would be better off and we would have no need for any austerity. In that case, why don't you publish the figures? Mike McKenzie. If Gavin Brown believes this is correct, presiding officer, we would have to ask him, as a Tory who presumably doesn't believe in a dependency culture, why he believes that we should be forever dependent on the rest of the UK. We, should, we would have to ask him, as a Tory who presumably believes in self-sufficiency, why we in Scotland should not be self-sufficient. We would have to ask him why, as a unionist and a Tory, why he doesn't agree that it would be better for Scotland and also for the rest of the UK for Scotland to have the full powers to improve its economic performance. Surely that's also better for his beloved UK. Presiding officer, I believe that Gavin, Gavin Brown believes, that, as I do, that the Scottish Government has been following a wise economic course since 2007. I believe that Gavin Brown believes this because the data is unequivocal. The Scottish economy has begun to outperform the UK economy since 2007. And I believe that Gavin Brown believes, as I do, that we have great opportunities to grow the Scottish economy, significantly increasing our productivity and therefore our competitiveness and our fiscal performance. But where we differ, presiding officer, is that Gavin Brown believes that maintaining the union in its present form trumps all other considerations. Gavin Brown believes that maintaining an archaic system of government should be our highest consideration and our highest priority. And Gavin Brown believes in a dismal economic philosophy based on an outdated idea that driving down real wages and creating a new class of working poor increases our competitiveness. 
And if this plan was working, George Osborne would have met his deficit reduction targets rather than missing each and every one of them. Because it's true that the UK is growing faster than some other economies, but it's growing from a lower base. And it's growing on the backs of increasing numbers of poor rather than growing by creating real prosperity. And it's growing in a way that's failing to produce sufficient taxation to properly reduce the deficit. President officer, there's another way we can see the reduction of the de deficit delivered over a slightly longer time frame. That can see the deficit reduced in a more sustainable way. The, S the SNP economic plan has been endorsed by the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. It's a plan where growth is delivered through investment in our people and in our infrastructure. It's a plan where growth is delivered by fiscal stimulation and investment directed to areas where we have comparative advantages. It, close, please. It's a plan to deliver higher wages and a prosperity that is shared by all of Scotland's people. And it's a fairer and ultimately a faster way to master our debt, where we're the masters of our finances and not the victim of them. Because money should always be our servant and it should never be our master. Thank you. And I now call Graham Pearson to be followed by John Mason. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, for the opportunity to play a part in this afternoon's debate. It's, to some extent, is depressing, though one should have anticipated that we reaffirm some of the arguments that we engaged in last autumn. No one in these benches mentioned anything about Scotland being too wee or too poor. No one on these benches said anything about the history that led us to that well-known debate about full policy levers of independence, a phraseology the Cabinet Secretary returned to today. And it's in that context that no one on the front benches of the government mentioned full fiscal autonomy. It's the subject under discussion just now it's important that we have clarity as to the impact that arises from full fiscal autonomy. But to me, as a simple Scotsman, it looks suspiciously like independence chapter one, with Barnett apparently in there somehow, but with the IFS showing signs that £7.6 billion will be the shortfall in our budgets in the coming years. To that extent, it's frightening to think that a government would take us forward with no clear idea of how much is coming forward. I'm happy to take an intervention. Mike McKenzie. Is what he uh, has just said not another way of saying that we're too poor? Graham Pearson. It's certainly not. If we were too poor, we wouldn't have the light switched on in the chamber today. We do have money. It's how we manage that money and where we anticipate the money will come from in the future. And that £7.6 billion shortfall has impacts and implications for public services. Only today, in this country, the Scottish Federation has pointed to the fact that £60 million being cut from the Police Scotland budget has serious implications for policing on our streets. How much more impact does a loss of £7.6 billion pounds from a total budget of somewhere in excess of £30 billion, how much impact does that have on a whole range of national health service, education, roads, and all the other uh, responsibilities that we accept here in Scotland? I'm happy to take it. I thank Graham Pearson for taking a brief intervention and following on from his comments there uh, regarding it's how you spend the money. Would Graham Pearson agree with me, therefore, then it's uh, in order to save money, it would be better off to actually scrap Trident and the £100 billion pounds that that actually would cost the economy? Graham Pearson. Well, I, I don't know how full fiscal autonomy has any impact on whether we run Trident or otherwise. Um, and I'm sure it's a good distraction from the main purpose of our, our argument today. But the important matter that we must face is that as a parliament, 
We exist in a country where the number of food banks currently stand in excess of 345. The number of homeless persons uh, are maintaining at an unacceptable level with 299 children declared homeless in addition to the numbers who were declared homeless this time last year. So our attention should be uh, dedicated to ensuring that those 30 billion plus are better spent across Scotland and that we function in a way that our government is effective in delivering the service that Scottish people want. The Cabinet Secretary indicated that the benefits from his approach will to enhance economic performance. I can't join the dots up between the declaration that he makes in this Parliament and how he will deliver the enhancement of economic performance. And then there's an illusion that there'll be an increase in productivity, an enhancement of productivity. And again, that seems to me to be out with the influence and power that the Cabinet Secretary has in this regard, because the enhancement of productivity across the private sector will be very much a matter for those industries that are based here in this country and the way in which they deliver and the services and the exports that we require from them. Too much. I'm happy to accept it. Okay. Can I thank Graham Pearson for taking the intervention. Is that not exactly the point that the Scottish Government seeks the power to stimulate our economy? That being the case, what's Labour's proposition to accelerate growth specifically in Scotland? Graham Pearson. I, I wish I had time left in the, the time that I have here. And, and the Minister knows fine well the, the game that's played here in these debates. The reality is that we are facing the growing presence of zero-hour contracts. Labour has declared against zero-hour contracts. The reality is that there's too much part-time working and people who exist on, on the margins of real living in, in our nation. And the reality is that Labour proposes that there should be an £8 an hour living wage, and we have committed to it. And we've encouraged the government benches over the last year to declare that for their public Thank contracts George, across please. Scotland. And glad to see eventually they've come forward and supported that proposal. In short, I would like to hear more of what full uh, fiscal autonomy really means and what the impact would be for Barnet and the total budget available in the years ahead should the Cabinet Secretary get his way. Thanks very much, President Officer. Thank you. I now call on John Mason to be followed by Alex Johnston. Six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I have to say it's a great pleasure uh, to be having the opportunity to debate the economy once again, I think the third time in about a month. And clearly the opposition parties think that this is a strong point for them, yet all the evidence shows that this is not the case. I think it's useful, too, to look at past record as an important factor in this kind of debate, and I would like to just uh, spend a minute or two looking at the past record of some respective governments. First of all, the Conservatives. Now, at Westminster, as Mike Mackenzie told us, the Conservatives have miss missed virtually all their targets eh, as far as debt and so on was concerned. And sure, we might accept that they have controlled expenditure, but they have controlled expenditure in a very harsh way, which is not acceptable to most civilised people in Scotland. The Conservatives have a history of being cold-hearted and often seem to forget it is real people who suffer as a result of their impersonal economics. Then we have Labour. Now, Labour at Westminster oversaw a collapse of the UK economy, and some people would argue that mismanaging the economy is a trademark of Labour governments. However, again, it can be said, of course, that in the past, if Labour were mismanaging the economy, they did it in a much nicer way than the Tories did. Yet in more recent times, Labour have lost that caring approach as they sought to get votes from Tory Middle England. Of course, these days we are focused on resisting the harsh Conservative welfare reforms, yet during my time at Westminster, we were also resisting harsh welfare reforms, only that time these were harsh Labour welfare reforms. And lest the Lib Dems feel that they are being left out of my uh, past recollections, where are they standing these days? Before 2010, People thought that the Lib Dems were to the left of Labour, and they thought that Lib Dems stood for democratic reform, like STV. 
Yet five years later, and after five years of the Lib Dems in government, we see no serious electoral reforms, and they have propped up a Tory government which most of their supporters did not want. By contrast, I would suggest that the SNP record in government has been extremely good. We have run a balanced budget, we have introduced more progressive taxation, and protected most vulnerable from the worst Westminster cuts. Just today, we have, two new we have a new bankruptcy laws in place. We have two just a, a moment. We have two new taxes in place, and Revenue Scotland has also been introduced today. And I understand that the rail franchise projects have been given a very positive appraisal by Audit Scotland. The records speak for themselves. In the 2011 election, I and others were elected on the slogan, Record, Team, Vision. And it clearly it continues to be the case that this party and this government have the best record, the best team, and the best vision. Gavin Brown. <laughs> <laughs> I'm grateful to the member for giving way. He talked about Kevin balanced budgets, so, but is it not the case so that this financial year there will be something like £150 million that his government is unable to spend despite demanding more money and demanding more money now? I, I think if the member looks mention? at the percentages, that is exceptionally good. And if he, he works within that level of department. accuracy with his monthly salary, he's doing very well. Presiding officer, to change tax slightly and to uh, keep Malcolm Chisholm uh, happy, as he referred to uh, no detriment earlier on, uh, we have the Labour and Tories suggesting that more powers might lead to Scotland being worse off. Now, clearly the no detriment principle is a central factor in all of this. If any further powers are to be transferred to the Scottish Parliament, this was agreed by all the parties as part of the Smith Commission. And if I can quote from paragraph 95... Uh, subparagraph 3, it says, underlined, no detriment as a result of the decision to devolve further power. The Scottish and UK government's budgets should be no larger or smaller simply as a result of the initial transfer of tax and or spending powers before considering how these are used. A, this means that the initial devolution and assignment of tax receipts should be accompanied by a reduction in the block grant equivalent to the revenue foregone by the UK government and the opposite applies if it's spending powers. It, from this it is cl clear that the additional transfers of powers should be matched by a change in the block grant and theoretically if you took that far enough if it happened to be a year when Scotland was subsidising the UK we might have to pay a, a compensation and if it was a year when the UK was doing better they might have to pay us. Lewis MacDonald. I'm, I'm grateful to Mr Mason. Does he acknowledge that the Smith Agreement is precisely in terms of a position where taxes uh, and revenues are shared between the United Kingdom and the Scottish Government and that full fiscal autonomy could not be more different from what is described in the Smith Agreement? John Mason. Progression beyond that, but it can never be complete. We voted, we voted against independence, sadly in my opinion, but we voted against it to stay in the UK and so that we would be no better off. And the principle of no detriment applies uh, even if we're sharing to the extent that only VAT, uh, defence and uh, foreign affairs are excluded. So theoretically, if all the powers were transferred and if that was calculated to put Scotland at a net disadvantage, that commitment is there, as far as I can see, that the block grant would compensate for that. And there's also the political issue that no Scottish government a, or a team, a team to a, discuss these things would be arguing for powers and being poorer off. We'd be arguing for powers and being either equally well off or, in fact, better off and getting things like high-speed rail brought right to Scotland. This part is particularly straightforward as far as I'm concerned. I would suggest that it's uh, more complex when we get to post-devolution, but we'll not go there uh, today. The Conservatives seem to be suggesting that the SNP now, might please. want more powers, even if that was to leave Scotland worse off, and this is clearly nonsense, and no one believes it. Presiding officer, we're debating the economy today. I hope I've shown that both on past record and as we look forward to the coming elections, it is only the SNP that can be trusted with this important area of ordinary people's lives. Thank you. Many thanks. Thank you. Now, Conan Alex Johnson to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Six minutes. Again, can I begin by congratulating the SNP? We've done very well here. We're more than an hour into this debate, and they've still successfully managed to avoid giving the impression that they even understood the question that was set out in the opening speech. We've heard a lot of rubbish. We've heard the accusation that we think Scotland's too wee and too poor, one which simply causes offence on this side of the House and should cause offence to large numbers of people within Scotland. We've heard the accusation that uh, we have a bad record and they choose to rely on their record 
one which was achieved under the fiscal discipline imposed by a government in Westminster, and one which I've praised John Swinney for many times. I think Jackie Bailey was disgraceful in the way she attacked John Swinney. She was suggesting that he somehow had committed himself to Tory austerity simply by putting forward a budget that included the requirements to balance the budget in which he works under. I've praised John Swinney in the past. I will do it again. He's a man who has done a great job in making limited financial, uh, uh, limited money go as far as it can within Scotland. That's why I find it extraordinary that that same man who has done so well for so long under such pressure is now prepared to put his name behind the policy of full fiscal autonomy and deny the uh, and not take up the opportunity that he has to give us these numbers. The truth is that what the SNP are trying to do today is exercise blind faith against real judgment. What we've asked for are the numbers. We know that full fiscal autonomy is possible. We know that if we were to come to agreement that Scotland could take charge of its fiscal future. Yet what we are suggesting is that as far as we can see, and in the view of a number of fiscal experts, when the numbers are placed on the table and the calculations are made, there is a black hole at the centre of that calculation. We have, no I will not, I have, we have today challenged the Scottish National Party to come up with an explanation of how that black hole would be filled. And time and time again, we have taken interventions from people who might have been thought would come up with some numbers, but no, no numbers have been forthcoming. Time and again, we've heard the minister and others on his back benches say that, of course, we need the powers to address Scotland's fiscal position. But they seem only too willing to take the powers without taking the true fiscal responsibility. I hear what John Swinney has to say. I understand that a Scottish government with full fiscal autonomy would have the ability to change the way Scotland runs in the future. It would have the opportunity, uh, if it did the right things, to stimulate growth. But there is this massive blind assumption at the centre of this argument that all that growth and all that additional revenue would be with us very early in that process. And those of us who have understood and studied government and their finances over the years realises that that simply would not be the case. A Scottish government with full fiscal autonomy would wish to make changes to stimulate growth. But there would be an upfront cost. I don't know what that upfront cost would be. I don't know what the policies of that government would be. But there would be an upfront cost. Money would have to be invested in order to achieve these returns. So not only is there the apparent black hole which exists at the centre of Scotland's finances, but also there is the cost of that necessary investment. We've heard from John Swinney earlier that Scotland produces £1,600 more per person in uh, revenue per year. I presume that's overall productivity, GN, uh, GDP. But of course that figure was based on a full share, geographical share of oil revenue. And that oil revenue we know will be smaller over the next few years. But neither did he tell us how much of that £1,600 per person would have to be taken in tax in order to invest. We even heard last Thursday the First Minister project that in a few years' time, Scotland's uh, total productivity, its total GDP, could be up by £15 billion. I think that's the figure she used. The irony is that more than half of that £15 billion in growth would be required to be taken in tax in order to begin to plug this black hole. We are in a very lucky position. Scotland has a, dev has a devolved government, but it has shared finances with the rest of the United Kingdom. That saves us 
from the impact of economic shocks like the collapse in the oil price. What we have as a result of this deal is a financial position that allows us to ensure you that we will close, continue please. to have a national health service, we will continue to have our welfare payments made, we will continue to see pensions paid to our pensioners and continue to see our young people educated. But the hole in our projections indicates that we close, could lose please. one or more of these things if we make an error at this time. So the challenge is to the Iron Chancellor of Scotland, prove that you aren't the cowboy, prove that you aren't the gambler must close, who is willing please. to borrow the stake in Scotland's future. Prove this is not a leap in the dark. Give us the numbers and then we might start to believe you. Thanks very much. Now Colin Stewart McMillan to be followed by Ian Gray. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm going to focus my comments on the amendment in the name of John Swinney, which I, uh, which I support. Uh, but, uh, but yet again, Presiding Officer, it's uh, another economy debate and another two and a half hours of talking Scotland down from the Unionist parties. But I think it's important uh, to actually ensure that some facts are highlighted in the debate. Scotland's economic expansion in the last quarter means two years of uninterrupted growth. Scotland is outperforming the UK with higher employment and lower unemployment. Youth, employment, sorry, youth unemployment has fallen uh, to its lowest level in five years, and female employment has increased to its highest level on record. Now, these are facts. These facts clearly show that measures from uh, the SNP Scottish Government are helping the economy. Uh, these measures are, are, are the measures uh, such as uh, we've got the most competitive business rate uh, in the UK, investing £11 billion in Scotland's infrastructure. Uh, from the three years up to 2015-16. They expand the level of funded childcare from 475 hours to 600 hours per annum. And this helps those with young children actually get back into the workplace. And the Scottish Government's activities of certainly working towards providing 30,000 new modern apprenticeships per annum by 2020. These measures are, are significant, but also limited. Uh, and the powers of this Parliament are limited, uh, a point that uh, Alex Johnson just mentioned a few moments ago. And so the, the powers of this Parliament are limited, and I'm sure that if more powers were here, such as either being independent or with fiscal autonomy, then a Scottish Government could actually do more. Today's debate is clearly focused on the, the Westminster election, however, uh, and it's obviously underway. And obviously, Westminster policies have an effect upon all of us here in Scotland. Now, Alex Johnson also mentioned a few moments ago in terms of the, of the bad record. Well, let's consider some of this bad record that's actually happened in recent years. The level of UK net borrowing has exceeded the June 2010 forecast by over £50 billion to 2014-15. George Osborne predicted in 2010 that the UK would run a surplus on the structured current budget of around £5 billion of 2014-15. He now expects a deficit of £46 billion. In the most recent budget, only a couple of weeks ago, the Tory Lib Dem UK government committed to a further £30 billion of cuts by 2017-18. £12 billion of that is to come from welfare cuts. So, presiding officer, the Tories and Lib Dems are not content with forcing 71,428 people to food banks in 2013-14, of whom 22,000 were children. Women are bearing more than three quarters of the impact of tax and welfare changes. More than half of disabled people who claim DLA it will see their benefits cut by £1,000 per annum. And the poorest 10% of households are being hit the hardest, and that's coming from the IFS. But they actually want to inflict even more pain and misery into the households of Scotland. Child Poverty Action Group. So, okay. I'm very, very grateful to Stuart McMillan for, for giving way. Given that the SNP government in Scotland have committed after a UK general election to stick to the Tory spending plans for 2015-16 financial year, then how, 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 would, how would he tackle the issues around food banks and all the other issues that we need to tackle in Scotland that we don't have a year to wait? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm going to come on to that point regarding uh, continuing uh, austerity measures, because that's certainly a point that the Labour Party have signed up to time and time again. And also, and also Ed Balls, uh, the Shadow Chancellor, the day after the budget, uh, indicated on the radio that he wouldn't have changed anything in the budget. 
The Child Poverty Action Group suggests 100,000 100, more children will be pushed into poverty because of the Tory Lib Dem plans and the poorest households will be worse off by £466 due to cuts in welfare. Now, that particular figure is not mine. That comes from Her Majesty's Treasury, the budget document itself. Now, clearly, this is grim. It's grim stuff. And clearly, that the UK establishment is bad for your health. The IFS are questioning where the axe is going to fall next in terms of the welfare budget. They indicate that no more than £2 billion has been highlighted and they're asking about the remaining £10 billion of cuts. These cuts are to be in place for 2017-18, so time is running out. Now, I make no bones about highlighting the Westminster attack on the poorest in society because Labour has backed the Tories all the way. Now, it's certainly, unfortunately, Malcolm Chisholm, I didn't have to be on well on, but it's no longer in the chamber. That's, I've already given a one, uh, one intervention. Uh, Ed Balls did give the game away uh, the day after uh, the budget uh, when he was asked a question, and he did say, he's quoted as saying, there's nothing I'm saying to you from yesterday I would reverse. There you have it, presiding officer. The Westminster parties, the Westminster elite, in fact, wanting Scotland to vote for business as usual. Being tied to the cuts that have happened and to those in the pipeline is a clear message to everyone. If you're in benefits or if you're from the working poor, then you will be punished. This is why Scotland needs more SNP MPs at Westminster. It's not to join the unionist establishment. It's about, to help, it's about trying to help the people who need it the most. And if we do that to help Scots, then we also will be able to help everyone across these islands. By sending more SNP MPs to Westminster, we might actually get the Smith proposals and more to help our constituents. And who knows, we might even provide a spine to Labour close, that, that they sold long, long, a long time ago to help keep the Tories out of Downing Street. Whether it's by issue by issue or a confidence in supply, if Labour have a progressive conscience, then they can do the correct thing for a change. However, the Westminster parties need to set out their detailed plans uh, for welfare ahead of this election. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I now call on Ian Gray to be followed by Chick Brody. Thank you, President Officer. Jackie Bailey was right. It is uh, passing strange that here we are debating the core demand of the SNP, short of independence. And yet we're doing it not in government time, but in opposition time yet again. Indeed, not only are the SNP reluctant to debate full fiscal autonomy, they are nearly incapable of pronouncing the words, having to find contorted euphemisms. Today, it is social and economic powers necessary to reflect the needs and preferences of the people of Scotland. Mr Brown gave us an even more egregious example from early, earlier on. Truly, this is the policy which dare not speak its name. And no wonder, because full fiscal autonomy it would leave Scotland with a fiscal black hole of £7.6 billion. That's £1,400 pounds for every person in Scotland. It's equivalent to a 15p increase on every tax band, and it would cause the loss of 138,000 jobs. Every aspect of the public finances, from education to health to, to, to police and security, would be jeopardised by such a cut. The detrimental effect, too, would not just be felt by users of public services. The investments we need to make in skills and innovation and infrastructure to support and grow our economy would be damaged as well. Economists know these figures are true. Commentators know these figures are true. Indeed, Peter Jones in The Scotsman called full fiscal autonomy insanity. Indeed, it's such a crazy idea that it's clear John Mason can't quite bring himself to believe that this is the policy of the party he represents. But the Cabinet... Sure. I wonder well, if the member government. might address the uh, macroeconomic framework within which we operate as part of the UK, which has led us to the situation that he subscribes to of Scotland being incapable to uh, stand on its own two feet financially. If he subscribes to that opinion, does he not share, uh, shed some of the light of blame upon the Westminster system within which we operate? Ian Gray. Let, let me come to that point in just a moment. Uh, but, but let's stick for a second with the consequences of full fiscal autonomy, because the First Minister knows these consequences are true as well. When they were put to her yesterday on the radio, she didn't deny them. She said, don't worry, it won't happen just now. This is the St. Augustine defence. Lord, grant me full fiscal autonomy, but grant me it not yet. Presiding officer, nobody in this chamber has ever said that Scotland is too wee, too poor or too stupid, except for SNP members. 
But there, right there, is the First Minister saying on radio yesterday, Scotland is not quite ready for these powers yet. It is not the timing that is wrong with full fiscal autonomy. It is the principle. Pooling and sharing resource is the best way to manage our economy and our public finances. And it's not just about oil either, although that's the best way to manage that kind of volatility. And it's not about the status quo for labour. It is also about a mansion tax redistributing wealth across the UK. It is about sharing in a 50p tax rate on 300,000 taxpayers, not 15,000. It is about taxing bankers' bonuses in the city of London, not just the city of Edinburgh. Pooling and sharing, which will not only avoid the extra austerity of fiscal autonomy, but fund extra nurses, extra grants for students, and extra resources to close the attainment gap in our schools. And then there is the other defence of fiscal autonomy, the magic growth defence. New powers will suddenly see productivity boom, exports surge, and the population grow. The economy will surge like an Asian tiger to levels never seen before in Western Europe. And in evidence for this, the Cabinet Secretary offered us the progress made in recent years. But that progress is exactly the success of devolution, using the stability and additional resource made available by the very pooling and sharing of resources he seeks to dismantle. And indeed, now the SNP have even managed to reduce their only actual economic policy, a big corporation tax cut for big businesses, to ambiguity. The First Minister spinning that she has dropped it, the Cabinet Secretary saying he has not. How ironic then that the Government motion asks for everyone else to lay out economic plans. Presiding Officer, Labour is doing just that. And the Cabinet Secretary knows it because he's been borrowing them. For months we've been committed to a 50p tax rate. No way, said Alex Salmond. Read my lips, no tax rises. Then last weekend, up pops Mr Swinney to announce a 50p tax rate. Presiding officer, today, Labour has announced that after 12 weeks in work, no one can be forced to work on a zero-hours contract towards a fairer country in which everyone shares in economic growth. I look forward to the imminent announcement by the SNP that this was always their policy and they just hadn't mentioned it to us. And as for welfare... I heard, the, close, please. I heard the Cabinet Secretary say, judge me by my actions. The little bit of welfare which has been devolved in recent years, and much more to come under Smith, has seen 80% of cash benefits replaced by vouchers and payment in kind. That's a harsh welfare reform, an SNP welfare reform. Is that their plan? Presiding officer, we know what the SNP's policy is, even if they won't talk about it. They cannot admit it because they know it would be a disaster. Thanks very much. And I now call on Chick Brodie to be followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today I welcome the debate and its recognition that we do seek full fiscal autonomy. Now let me focus on <coughs> and demolish some of the shibboleths and foundations proposed in the motion. I said last week that the UK forecasts of tax receipts in Scotland by the OBR and fed into the Treasury uh, uh, were reflected in our funding by the UK were nonsense. And the OBR is the basis of not just only the Treasury forecast but also some uh, experts. Now listen to this. The OBR report which I uh, looked at yesterday, OBR report of March 15 said it, it, its report of March 2012 said it is not possible to replicate in full, in full, the methodology for Scots tax receipts we use for the UK. The data, it goes on, and not just for them, I remember, the experts. The data goes on and says that we would need to produce a Scottish macroeconomic forecast and the information is generally not available. That was in March 2012. And what did they say yesterday? That still remains the case. And of course, and despite that admission to continue to opine on oil and gas revenues showing a decline despite the Brent crude barrel price today rising by 11% uh, since its low earlier this year and a commodities future projection increase of 30 to 40% for 
by the middle of 2016. In fact, the Economic Recovery Agency predicts a rise of about 100%, and the bookies are never wrong. Why would we leave our fiscal determination and negotiation of meaningful full fiscal autonomy to that incompetent organisation? Its inability to forecast, its narrowness of forecasting leaves other experts uh, to come up with misplaced scenarios of impen impending economic doom. Scenarios built on a halfway house of partial Scottish Government receipts and the Barnett formula. And we are supposed to negotiate with them uh, on full fiscal autonomy. As I quoted last week, and for the benefit of Mr Macdonald, who misquoted me, Lord Barnett himself said, in the event of Scotland getting more pa tax powers, retaining the Barnett formula would be, I quote, a terrible mistake. That, of course, was then mirrored by Jack McConnell, predicting that new tax powers coming to Holyrood would diminish the Barnett form. No, 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 no. Uh, do we then, do they, do we believe that they, at least, did not know the ultimate destination? Of course they did. But we are where we are. In invoking of financial experts, and I repeat, doing their forecasts on the back of the OBR, I would prefer to listen as I did this morning to Jim McCall, who eh, on GMS laid out his rationale for full fiscal autonomy. And of course, that timescale can and will only uh, be determined after discussion that we'd have to have with the Treasury. No. And in respecting where we are, I have to ask Mr. Brown and the Tories to accept Scotland is not an economic basket case, and that commentary of that sort would best be served by looking at performance over a period of time and not just uh, looking at one moment in time. Uh, uh, for example, oh no, over the past five years, uh, looking at North sea, uh, excluding North Sea revenues as a percentage of GP, GDP, Scotland has consistently had a higher uh, revenue to uh, GDP percentage than the rest of the UK. And that's why the uh, First Minister illustrated quite clearly with confidence that growing the onshore economy by £15 billion by 2020 20 was very relevant. Our tax receipts, as the uh, Deputy First Minister just said, over the last 40 years have been higher than the rest of the U UK. So we can't just look at a one-off scenario where, for example, in 2014, in the oil and gas industry, where operating costs grew by 11%, and we all know why, and capital investment increased by 12%, reducing company tax liabilities, uh, but of course not... Uh, uh, of course, having a, a beneficial effect on future uh, income. The, the, because of the UK government policy, there are other aspects, uh, particular changes in NI, but I mentioned earlier on the allocation of, of indefinable uh, ex expenditure through the CRA. And over the last five years, Scotland has, has been allocated £730 million for nuclear decommissioning. It was allocated £263 million for, for the Olympics. Wouldn't it be better that we decided our own uh, revenue determination and expenditure? We have to be in a position where we, where we increase investment, innovation, exports and growth. Presiding officer, we are already showing the impact of non-North Sea uh, oil activity on, on the base performance of Scotland. And in the EET committee on our inquiry on exports and, and internationalisation, we showed how vital the impact of that would be on our economy and its performance. And the government's strategy is to increase exports by 50% over the period 2010-2017. And over the first three years of that period, we have in fact already increased it by 20%. Comparing where we are with Smith and with uh, full financial powers and looking at the OCE report, uh, under Smith, the impact of exports would increase GDP by 2.7%, employment by 67,000, and tax revenues by 1.6 billion. To draw to a With full, close, please. Fi full financial powers, GDP would rise to 3%, employment to 81,000, and tax revenues of 1.7 billion. And the same or similar comparisons would apply to the impact on further capital investment and improved productivity. So, all of that and more without a beneficial impact of oil and gas in the North Sea, not to mention, as I would, on the West Coast and the Western Isles. So we have to ensure that we you draw to try and complete please. the journey on full fiscal autonomy as soon as we can, so that we can have full determination of the economic destiny of our country. Thank you. Now call on Willie Rennie to be followed by Mark MacDonald.
Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, for allowing me to participate in the debate this afternoon. And I apologise to the, to the Chamber and to Gavin Brown for not being able to be here for the start of the debate. I was in Turnbury, a place I never thought I would go to trump Turnbury, um, to take part in the Scottish Police Federation Conference. And unfortunately, um, the Transport Secretary's roadworks on the way back up um, uh, delayed me. I don't know if he's here to apologise uh, for that, but uh, I apologise to the, to the Chamber nevertheless for me being late uh, today. Um, it's actually a very simple motion, a very simple request and a simple question that Gavin Brown has posed today. In all the debate about full fiscal autonomy and all the rest of it, and about the finances of our country and about economic growth and all these other matters, it's really just a simple question. Can we have the publication of a document? That's all we're asking for. We're not making any judgments. And I think members from the SNP side could probably support Gavin Brown's simple request. But so far, not one single SNP member, and I've been listening very carefully, but not one single SNP member has even indicated that it might be quite a good idea for us to know whether what the um, SNP have in their plans for the analytical bulletin on oil and gas. Just an updated document. Now, what they say is that we don't have all the information. It's unpredictable. We couldn't possibly publish it. Well, thank goodness it's just an academic exercise. Thank goodness we don't have an independent country. Thank goodness people last year didn't decide to vote yes. Because I think that excuse would not be something that this chamber or the people of Scotland would be satisfied with. I think they would want a little bit more information that their independent government might know what they were doing and might know what the projections were for oil revenues going forward. But I think that proves the point that we were making during the referendum last year that this is an unpredictable resource. It's volatile, it's falling over time, it's difficult to predict. And to base the finances, the economy of a country on such a volatile, such an unpredictable and falling resource is something that I would regard as political folly and therefore I would not support. And I think that's why people in Scotland rejected it. So perhaps by the failure to publish this updated oil and gas bulletin, they proved the point that we were making last year, that it is unpredictable. It is uncertain and it is falling over time and they're too embarrassed to publish it, therefore. That's, I think, is the summing up of this debate. And I'm sure Gavin Brown will reflect on that in his summing up himself. Now, when I question the plans of Labour-run Fife Council, I am not in favour of abolishing Fife. When I criticise the plans of any UK government, I'm not in favour of criticising or abolishing the United Kingdom. Likewise for the European Union. So when I question the plans of the Scottish Government and this SNP Government, I am not saying that Scotland should be abolished or I'm questioning the existence of it. All I am doing is doing my duty as a member of the Scottish Parliament to question their plans and to suggest otherwise I think is insulting, it's tired and it is false and they need to reflect on their tired old rhetoric. I think um, what we've seen in the budget, and this I was pleased that John Swinney recognised that the, the UK government had met, I think, the ambitions of the oil industry in the budget with the changes on the investment allowance, the supplementary charge, the petroleum revenue, various measures of reducing tax to incentivise investment in the North Sea. I mean, I, I, th I heard him myself on the radio where he found it really difficult to find anything at fault um, with the UK government's plans, and I, I, I credit him for doing so. That was £1.3 billion worth of cost to the UK Treasury, but it will return £4 billion of investment from the industry, resulting in 0.1% of GDP for the United Kingdom. Now, we were able to do that within the framework of the United Kingdom. There was not one penny cut from the budget of the Scottish Government as a result of those measures. Now, if we'd been independent, then we certainly would have had to pay the price of trying to get the oil industry back into growth and investment. But thank goodness we didn't make that decision last year or we would not have been able to have the flexibility and agility to do things differently within the United Kingdom to get the oil industry moving again. And we've heard from uh, Jackie Bailey about the, the reality of the seven £0.6 billion pound cuts that would be required. The Independent Institute of Fiscal Studies make that very, very clear. What we don't see anymore, um, as a result of the publication of the JERS figures, is the SNP's favourite leaflet, the 9.6 to the 9.3. 
because the, the 9.6 has dropped to 8.6, even though the 9.3 has stayed exactly the same. So I don't know if they're going to produce any new figures and new leaflets that will perhaps promote the benefit. The they're still using the old <laughs> figures, Alec Johnson says. He's absolutely right. The reality is that even though the tax take from Scotland has fallen, not one penny has been cut from the budgets of the Scottish Government. That is the benefit of the United Kingdom of pooling and sharing across the UK. Now, in conclusion, uh, Deputy President Officer, um, the SNP say it's all about the potential that we could have. If we had the economic levers, we could change everything. Now, the one big economic lever they never stopped talking about during the referendum was corporation tax. Now, I've still waiting. We've had how many debates in the last few weeks about, about the economy, and not one of them has mentioned corporation tax. Perhaps because they've ditched it, but also perhaps because the UK government plan created eight times as many jobs in a quarter please. of the time that the corporation tax proposal would have resulted in. So the reality is that the SNP have no ideas, no plans, they're bankrupt, and it's time that they shut up about full fiscal autonomy. Thank you very much. Now call on Mark Macdonald to be followed by Alec Rowley. Well, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I shall pass on to the Transport Minister that the roadworks he put in place were not as effective as we might have hoped they would have been. Um, we, here we are again today, Presiding Officer, another afternoon filled with depressing familiarity as we discuss the uh, opposition party's uh, interpretation of the financial sustainability of our nation. Now, I'm a fan of post-apocalyptic fiction as a genre, but only when it's well written uh, and well delivered. And sadly, Mr Brown's uh, entry to the genre didn't quite stand up to either of those measures. But let's play devil's advocate, because it's always fun to do so. Uh, and let's take Mr Brown uh, and his arguments uh, at face value. Now, Mr Brown is a fully paid up member of the UK fan club uh, and believes that the UK system serves Scotland well. And it's a point that I put to Mr Gray uh, in my intervention. I didn't quite catch the response that Mr Gray said he was going to give me later in his speech. Perhaps uh, I, I missed it as a, as a subtle reference. But if we accept, if we accept at face value the prognosis of the economic situation as laid out by Mr Brown and so enthusiastically lapped up by the Labour benches, then what does it say about the macroeconomic framework within which Scotland has operated over many years, what, within which Scotland will continue to operate under Mr Brown's uh, proposals? And what does it say about the effect that that has had on the economic circumstances of Scotland if Mr Brown is to be taken at his word that Scotland's economy is in a position where it could not sustain full fiscal autonomy, then surely it must be a damning commentary on the macroeconomic framework within which Scotland has been operating, that its economy has been allowed to develop to that situation. That is the position that we must, that is the conclusion that we must draw if Mr Brown is to be taken at face value, that the UK is not serving Scotland well and that the UK is actually holding Scotland as an economy back from being able to perform to its full capabilities if we are to take what Mr Brown says at face value. Now, Mr Gray uh, asserted, uh, I see he's, he's had to leave the chamber, Mr Gray asserted that uh, nobody on the unionist side has said that Scotland is too wee or too poor. Well, I'm very sorry, presiding officer, but the very implication of what is being said by the UK parties is exactly that, that Scotland as a nation is too poor. That is the very implication being put forward by the arguments which Mr Gray uh, and those with whom his party occasionally fraternises uh, continue to perpetuate and to propagate. Well, I hear, hear the Cabinet Secretary saying occasionally, frequently fraternises, uh, and uh, it's becoming uh, ever more difficult to tell the two apart. Indeed, the very argument around pooling and sharing, which is put forward uh, on repeated occasion, and indeed the way in the manner in which it was articulated by... Uh, in, in one second. In the way in which it was articulated by Mr Gray, where what he spoke about was uh, using money that is levied in London to be spent in Scotland, is entirely designed to perpetuate the notion that we as a nation are subsidised and that we require subsidy to be transferred from other parts of the UK to Scotland. That is the direct implication of that and that's what this phony war that has been going on between Mr Murphy and Diane Abbott and others in the London Labour Party has been entirely around generating that, that, perpe that perpetuating that myth that Scotland is a subsidised nation. I thought we'd move beyond that, presiding officer, as a result of the referendum campaign, but it seems that the unionist parties are back to playing the same old songs. And with that, I will hand over to Mr Brown. Kevin Brown. 
forgive me. What is the member's primary objection to John Swinney publishing the projections for full fiscal autonomy? Mark uh, uh, as Mr Brown may be aware, uh, we have been explicitly clear throughout that firstly, our belief was that Scotland should have full control of our own resources as an independent nation. And I think we laid out very clearly the implications of that uh, in the white paper and during the debate. And then we've been very clear that within the framework of the UK, uh, that Scotland should have the opportunity to exercise fiscal autonomy. And I see Murdo Fraser, I think it's Murdo Fraser, it's difficult to always tell from back here. I see Murdo Fraser sat next to Mr Brown. Mr Fraser, of course, used to be a very enthusiastic advocate of Scotland having fiscal autonomy. Indeed, many, made many speeches to that effect. I'm not sure what Mr Fraser has uh, made Mr Fraser change his mind on that. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm sure he'll be happy to share it with us. Indeed, indeed, indeed Mr. Mr Rennie as well, a man who believes in federalism and presumably within that uh, regions uh, of the United Kingdom having financial uh, accountability and autonomy within that, it seems to also disagree with the position that he has previously sincerely held. Now, we were told uh, by Mr Gray that uh, the Scottish Government has not put forward, or the SNP have not put forward, uh, an economic plan. Well, he may have been asleep over the last couple of weeks, but we've charted a very clear plan for how we can tackle the austerity agenda and put forward an alternative to the austerity agenda, which we believe should be pursued. It's an alternative to the austerity agenda, which the IFS, who have been quoted quite liberally during this debate, have have stated that the Labour Party could sign up to and still meet its proposals for deficit reduction. So there's nothing to stop them from doing so. But what is clear, presiding officer, is that what we want to see is Scotland as a nation achieve its full potential. And in order to achieve its full potential, we need to have control of all of the powers that will enable us to do that. We recognise and respect the result of the referendum, and we recognise that we must operate within the United Kingdom framework. But within that framework, we will never apologise for seeking the full extent of powers to ensure the full potential of Scotland can be realised. Thank you so much. And I now call on Alex Riley to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you, President Officer. What has been disappointing in this debate today is the way that some SNP members have chosen to talk Scotland down. And when we try, when we try and have a serious discussion around what is very important issues for the future of Scotland, then you know, for Mike McKenzie to come away with these, these sort of suggestions that Scotland's too wee, too stupid, too peer is just ridiculous. And for Mark Macdonald to start talking about the unionist side, I'm very clear as a Scot, a very proud Scot, that I've supported Home Rule for Scotland all my life. I'm not on the side of the unionists, I'm on the side of Scotland. And again, it is insulting. It is insulting to, 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 to have these kind of attacks made on you every time you try and ask serious questions. Now, I'm supporting, I'm supporting the amendment um, that's been put forward by, by Jackie Bailey um, to, today. And it's a picking up on the point that Willie, Willie Rennie made. Jackie Bailey's amendment calls on the Scottish Government to publish an updated outlook for Scotland's public finances on the basis of full fiscal autonomy and an updated oil and gas and alcohol bulletin before the UK general election. Now, if the Scottish Government are saying that they will not, they will not publish these documents, then, then at least have the good grace to explain why you will not, because this issue is such an important issue. Mr Swinney, when he was speaking, talked about the £12 billion of welfare cuts that are still to come and the damaging impact that would have in Scotland. And I agree, I agree entirely, and no doubt we would stand shoulder to shoulder to oppose that kind of approach to the economy. Indeed, in last week's debate, we, I think, were in agreement that there was nothing to celebrate about where the economy is right now. And I was reminded of that when I read a Herald editorial back in July, where they talked about the, re the recovery being a long time in coming, longer than was necessary, and it has some significant weaknesses. Conservative Party plans to gouge another £12 billion out of Social Security does not bode well for 
for the future. Indeed, Frances O'Grady of the TUC makes a fair point when she says that economic growth is driven by low pay and low productivity. So for my constituents, and I'm sure for constituents across Scotland, then this election that's coming forward is really important because if we're going to have more failed austerity and we're going to have these types of cuts, billions of pounds, into welfare, then we know that the future looks pretty bleak. But that's why, that's why it is legitimate if there are concerns around full fiscal autonomy and if it is the view, and the view has been expressed by a lot of independent, independent experts in terms of economic experts, that we would be facing, we would be facing a £7.5 billion pound further deficit, then it is legitimate, I suggest to you, it is legitimate that any member of this Parliament to get to their feet and ask these questions. And that's all we're doing. Mark MacDonald. I am grateful to the member for giving way, and I have a lot of time for Alec Crowley and the arguments that he puts forward in this chamber. He mentions uh, that he wants to see a reversal to some of the austerity cuts that are taking place. Is he supportive of the proposal for a 0.5 per cent increase per annum in public expenditure, which would meet Labour's deficit reduction targets, but would allow us to take an alternative approach to the austerity agenda that is being put forward? Alec Rowley. I am supportive of the proposal to abolish the bedroom tax and use the funding that is currently being there um, to mitigate the bedroom tax. £175 million pound that would be to create an anti-poverty fund in Scotland. We lack in this Parliament and we lack coming from this government a clear anti-poverty strategy for Scotland and that's where we need to get to. In terms, in terms of the welfare state, I'm in favour of um, abolishing the government targets for benefit sanctions. I visited a, a food bank in Cowdenbeath yesterday um, and you know, I praise the work of the, the Trussell Trust and all the volunteers, but we've got to find a way to tackle the underlying problems of poverty so that we can abolish food banks once and for all. So that's what I'm in favour of. Uh, Mr Mackenzie. Mackenzie. I thank the member for uh, taking the intervention. I, I, and I note that earlier in the speech is calling for um, a Scottish Government analysis of the fiscal p position um, that Mr Swinney has explained, I think quite reasonably, would not come about for some years, hopefully not for six years, but, but hopefully sooner than that. Given, 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 given that Gordon Brown, Gordon Brown didn't recognise the credit crunch coming till it happened, I just wonder if both the Tories and the Labour Party have got some point, kind please. of crystal ball that allows them to accurately predict the future to that right. kind of degree That's of enough. precision. Mr, Mr. Perhaps... Kelly, I'll give you an extra a minute you. from now. I actually, I actually think that, that the, 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 the only good thing of Gordon Brown being in power when the credit crunch came was that he was in power and was able to take the steps that were necessary immediately to actually try um, and see us through that. And, and, and I think history, history will show that. But, but the, point, the point I'm making is that it has been suggested, and, and, and Gavin Brown in moving his, his motion today says that full fiscal autonomy will mean fundamental change for Scotland and will mean a 76 billion pound deficit. Indeed, he goes further and says that it will rise year on year and it will almost be at nine billion pound, not in five years time, but in three years time. What does that mean? What that means is massive cuts in public services in Scotland. What it means is massive cuts in the economic programme to get Scotland moving George, forward. Now, I finish, presiding officer, by saying it is the right, surely, of every member of this parliament, if there are serious questions, to ask the government to answer those questions. That's all we're doing today. Thank you. I now call on Sandra White, after which we move the closing speeches. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, sometimes I just uh, shake my head. I mean, there's obviously a general election around the corner, uh, as can be seen by the speeches from the unionist parties. And sometimes me think uh, they protest too much. They sometimes think they protest too much, as uh, even uh, said in resitting, they protest too much. 
Now, Alec Rowley said they have every right, and they do have every right, regardless of what political party they are, unionist or otherwise, they have every right to question. But so do we, and the government party as a backbencher, have a right to ask the question of the Labour Party, why they phoned old age pensioners, sent them letters, told them during the referendum they wouldn't get their pension. I have a right to get a reply from that. I have got a right to get a reply from the many people that live in my constituency of Polish and other origins who were told by the Labour Party and others by phone calls that they would be deported if they turned up to go and vote in the referendum. Now, I didn't want to go down that road again. But to be perfectly honest, when unionist parties get together, as they did during the referendum, and as they're doing just now, to talk Scotland down, and I didn't want to have to repeat this, but that is what they're doing constantly to frighten people. They frighten people during the referendum, and they're frightening them once again. I honestly do not understand their psyche. And the Scottish people don't understand that either. With Scottish, if you just let me finish, please, Mr. Rennie, the Scottish people will actually look at them and they'll pay the price for what they did, not just during the referendum, but what they're trying to do now. When you tell people in your own country that you're not genetically programmed to think politically, there's something sadly wrong, not with the people in this country, but the political parties that say that. I'll let Mr. Rennie in. Billy Rennie. She, she's a master at digression. Can I ask her? <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask her, is she in favour of publishing the Oil and Gas Bulletin? Andrew White. To, thank you. Can I just say to Mr Rennie, it will happen. But you know, quite funny, do you know, quite, and I'm in favour of it, but you know what's quite funny? You never reported, you never put forward your policies either, which states the fact that Scotland puts more money into the Westminster Treasury than we actually get back out. So when are you going to produce, when are you going to produce that and actually say... Tell the Scottish people the truth that we are not too poor. We do not need that lies that you tell. I'm sorry, President Officer, I shouldn't have said that. Untruths which have been told during the Might referendum. To I do want to, I do also want to, to get the back. terms of the motion and the amendment, yes. please. I would have liked that to happen to some of the other people, but never mind, Presiding Officer. I take that on board. Can, can I just say, Presiding Officer? It wasn't my intention to start my speech off like that, but I cannot sit and listen to the unionist parties constantly saying that Scotland needs the United Kingdom to survive. We can survive perfectly well on our own, and I'm sure they'll find out on May the 7th uh, this year. Now, I'd just like to say, I want to go back to actually what the motion says. Now, let's look at some of the, let's look at some of the key points, and thank you, President Officer. Let's look at some of the key points about full responsibility, fiscal autonomy, whatever way you want to call it. Now, with full responsibility, Scotland's resources would be given here to the Scottish Parliament and we'd be able to respond to the challenges that are coming forward and the austerity measures from Westminster, which, whilst they may deny it, the Labour Party support the austerity measures that the Tory party have put forward. So let's just put that one to rest. They support it. And the billions of pounds of cuts that will be coming to the Scottish people will come, regardless whether it's Labour or Tory who are in power in Westminster. But I want to put forward some of the arguments which we had put forward at various meetings also. Now, if we had full responsibility over the taxes, welfare, etc., we could look at the economy, absolutely. We could look at jobs. We could create more jobs for the Scottish people and protect their rights in the workplace, something we asked the Smith Commission to deliver, and they didn't deliver that. And that's another issue we've got to look at as well. The people of this country were promised the so-called vow by all these three Unionist Party leaders and none, and they didn't get that vow delivered. And that's something else that they have to answer to the Scottish people. We also could look at equality. It can't be right that the people with the most money get the most. We have to look on over after our vulnerable people, and everyone should be treated the same. And that's one of the issues which I think not a lot of people here have mentioned today. Now, let's look at something in regards to if the Scottish Government held the power, there would be a positive in impact on GDP. Employment and tax revenue would be significantly increased. Now, let's look at the moment. The Smith report set out steps to help improve the economy. However, these plans really benefit Scotland, do they or don't they? 
Now, let's look at it. They could benefit Westminster more than they do Scotland. The report states that plans to create 11,000 jobs in Scotland and the revenue would be estimated to £400 million. Now, that sounds really good, but the money isn't coming to Scotland, to the Treasury, or the revenue here. It goes to Westminster. Now, if we want to have control over these issues and create employment in a fair society, we have to have the power over the revenue and the fiscal economy as well. Uh, I see you nodding to be presiding officer, and I've only got a couple of seconds to finish. We need to have the powers of our welfare as well. There's people, as has been said by Alec Rowley, going to food banks in a rich country, not just like Scotland, but Britain as well. And yet those food banks are actually coming more and more and more. There's people on the streets, as has been said before, homeless. Why is that? We have control over our economy to do things differently, and it would be for the benefit of the Scottish people. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you. And we now move to the closing speeches. Now, Colin Lewis MacDonald, six minutes, please. Thank you very much. Well, here we are again, another debate on the economy about the choices facing Scotland, another opportunity for SNP ministers to spell out the implications of their flagship policy of full fiscal autonomy, another chance for the Scottish Government to tell voters just what they'll get if they vote SNP. Yet still, what is most striking is how little ministers have had to say on full fiscal autonomy. The amendment John Swinney brought forward in this debate fails to use those words at all. Instead, it says, as Ian Gray pointed out, Scotland requires the social and economic powers necessary to reflect the needs and preferences of the people of Scotland. Or in other words, Scotland needs the powers that Scotland needs in order to meet the needs of Scotland. Tautology would be a polite way of describing that. Stringing words together that mean nothing in order to avoid saying anything might be more like it. At three o'clock this afternoon, John Swinney was asked, challenged by Jackie Bailey, to say how he proposed to fill the funding gap of £7.6 billion a year after the abolition of Barnet. He sat down six minutes later, having offered absolutely no detailed explanation of how Barnet funded uh, formula funding could be replaced overnight. He was then challenged on when the SNP wanted to achieve full fiscal autonomy by. And he said that would have to be negotiated with somebody else. So perhaps he can now tell us his negotiating position. When is it he would like to achieve full fiscal autonomy by? Perhaps not. Perhaps not. Perhaps he agrees with Mike McKenzie that full fiscal autonomy shouldn't happen any time before 2021. And when the SNP were challenged on their support for Tory spending plans in this new financial year, Linda Fabiani said that was all right. It was too late to do anything about that. What a contrast with Labour's position. Confirmed by Ed Balls in Glasgow today that he will use his first budget if we win in May to begin to end Tory austerity with 800 million of extra spending in Scotland brought in as early as possible. If only we could have something as clear and straightforward from the SNP. They could, for example, say today that they would support that Labour budget if they had the opportunity to do so. After all, at the weekend, John Swinney said that the SNP would support Labour's policy of a 50p top rate of tax after all. So perhaps there are more U-turns to come, more areas where the SNP will come round to supporting Labour's plans. But if so, they have a lot of catching up to do. Or perhaps, like Mark Macdonald, they regard any proposals to raise taxes in London to pay for services in Scotland as a cunning ploy to promote Scottish dependency on England, surely our revealing insight into the peculiar world which some members of the SNP inhabit. Mr Macdonald. Mark Macdonald. Does the member believe Scotland uh, is or requires to be subsidised? I know, and I hope Mr Macdonald knows and understands as well, that the for Barnet formula provides additional public spending per head in Scotland, has done so over many years, and that the funding gap that is created now is growing and growing, and the SNP have brought forward no proposals to, to fill that gap. Of course, if SNP ministers don't want to talk about full fiscal autonomy or scrapping the Barnet formula, they can always get others to do it for them. Last week, we heard from the SNP backbenches that full fiscal autonomy didn't matter much because, after all, it wouldn't happen tomorrow, 
Well, and as we heard today, SNP Deputy Leader Stuart Hosey was asked by Andrew Neil about the same issue. His answers were revealing. I think that would be impossible to do within the year, he said. We are not at the position where we are talking about that today, he said. So the time frame, even if it's two, two and a half years, it sounds fine, but we're talking into the future. You wouldn't do something like that in three or four weeks. Then up pops Jim McCall on today's Good Morning Scotland to offer his version of full fiscal autonomy. He acknowledged the funding gap, as has been said, but his answer to the Barnett formula and the black hole created by full fiscal autonomy was simply to borrow the billions of pounds required to make up the difference and for the Scottish Government to get to keep all the taxes raised in Scotland and to keep the block grant from the UK Government at the same time. Surely our risk to Scotland's public services, both now and in the longer term, still uncosted, still fuelled by wishful thinking, but the nearest thing yet to an explanation of what the SNP leadership is really trying to achieve from this election campaign. Perhaps if SNP ministers endorse the McCall version of full fiscal autonomy, they can tell us how much they want the Scottish Government to borrow to pay for it and at what ongoing cost. Ministers really do need to address these issues. They need to be open with voters and tell them that full fiscal autonomy actually means scrapping the Barnett formula which supports Scotland's public services. They need to acknowledge that a black hole of 7.6 billion must mean real cuts in public services, either to address the deficit now or to pay back the borrowing if the pain is put off until later. And they need to be open that they have no ambition to add a single penny to Tory spending plans for the new financial year. The nearer we get to polling day, the harder it will become for Mr Swinney and his colleagues to disguise the consequences of their policies. And the more voters know about those consequences, the more minute. of them will choose real change by voting Labour. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on John Swinney. Uh, eight minutes, Deputy First Minister. Uh, presenting officer, I, I thought by the standards of um, uh, Jackie Bailey's uh, contortion of arguments, the one that she advanced today, that the Scottish Government, by uh, setting a budget within the financial limits that we are required to set it within, was somehow to um, surrender some control over our ability to set a budget it was just a, a quite ludicrous argument. I actually didn't follow it until Alec Johnson actually explained it for me. And it's a, some day that it takes Alec Johnson to explain <laughs> Jackie Bailey's contorted arguments to me. But I think the public of Scotland would be really quite surprised if I didn't, if I didn't set a budget uh, within the limits that are prescribed for me by the existing financial framework of the United Kingdom. Um, after all, that would somewhat injure my reputation with Alec Johnson for financial stewardship, which has been something very precious to me over the years. <laughs> um, I, I want to deal with a, a number of... Uh, so I thought that argument from Jackie Bailey was really, frankly, one of the most ridiculous arguments I've heard her peddle in this parliament over many years. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about Malcolm Chisholm's challenge to, to, to me about the whole process of fiscal consolidation, because I think there are a couple of facts upon which we... Uh, three facts I think Malcolm Chisholm and I should be able to agree. The first is that the Labour Party has signed up to the Charter of Budget Responsibility. That's point one, voted for by the Conservatives as well. Point two is that the Charter for Budget Responsibility requires 30 billion of fiscal tightening in 2016-17 and 2017-18. That's point two. So the Labour Party signed up, to, along with the Conservatives, to £30 billion worth of fiscal consolidation over those two financial years. And point three, which I hope Malcolm Chisholm and I can agree with, is that the proceeds of the mansion tax, the 50p tax rate, the bank levy, the banker's bonus, the pensions tax relief and the tobacco levy will generate in 2016-17 and 17-18 between them less than £10 billion, which leaves... £20 billion of fiscal tightening yet to be identified by the glorious Labour Party. So there we have it. There's the, there's the black hole, the bombshell at the heart of the Labour Party's fiscal policies. We've not heard much about all of that today. So I simply say to, to Malcolm Chisholm that there is a necessity for the Labour Party to stop trying to say to people that somehow 
they are doing anything other than perpetuating in this forthcoming United Kingdom general election campaign a continuation of their happy Better Together alliance with the Conservatives yeah. to take £30 billion yeah. out of public expenditure as a consequence of these issues. Well, I better give way to Malcolm Chisholm. Malcolm Chisholm. Chisholm. Forgive me, I noticed he's still reluctant to talk about full fiscal autonomy, but I, if, he was, listening, uh, if he was listening to the whole first half of my speech, I did deal with all of those issues. So the simple summary of it is the Labour Party is not signed up to the cuts of the Conservative Party and the Institute of Fiscal Studies. The Institute of Fiscal Studies has pointed to the £30 billion gap between Labour spending plans and Conservative yeah, spending plans. Well, John Mr Chisholm, I think Mr Chisholm was in for my speech where I spoke about fiscal autonomy earlier on today, and I'll come on to say more about it today. But Mr Chisholm can't escape the three facts that I've put on the record, which align the well, the first two facts align the Labour Party with the Conservative spending plans and the spending reduction plans, and the third demonstrates that the Labour Party still has got to set out where £20 billion worth of fiscal tightening is coming from, and that's a very significant issue. Now, Mr Rennie um, made a comment about the oil and gas tax changes, and I think he fairly recorded the fact that I have publicly um, encouraged before the budget and welcomed after the changes to taxation that the UK government have made. But I would just gently point out that one of the changes to taxation was to remove the supplementary charge increases which the Chancellor himself put in place in 2011. So that cannot by any stretch of the imagination be described as a, an example of sensible stewardship of the North Sea oil and gas revenues uh, for that to be applied in the first place. But Mr Rennie made the point that that had cost £1.3 billion. And that was a huge sum of money that could only be afforded by the United Kingdom. But in 2011-12, to give one example, North Sea oil and gas revenue increased by £2.5 billion. In one year, £2.5 billion up. And Mr Rennie's making a big thing about a £1.3 billion cost of the oil and gas tax changes. But in the same year, as the, as our, as the oil and gas revenues went up by £2.5 billion, the Scottish Government's budget was cut by £900 million. Now, my point in putting that information on the record is to illustrate that there are years of financial strength where Scotland has contributed significantly and had very strong uh, contributions, and we've had to face cuts despite the, the strong financial contribution that we have made to the United Kingdom Treasury. Now, if we... Uh, uh, yes, I will give way. Will there any? If he's so confident about this... Why doesn't he just publish the bulletin? That's all we're asking for. Just publish it. John the, government, the government has said that we'll publish the bulletin once we've completed all the analysis that's required to do so. So, so, there's, so there's, there's the answer. We've said that. And that's not, that's not some great revelation. That's something the First Minister has told Parliament on countless occasions beforehand. Now, if we also look at one of Mr Rennie's other claims, Mr Rennie also claimed that Scottish tra tax revenues had collapsed and were pro pro uh, and projected to collapse. None of the data that I've got in front of me from the uh, performance of Scottish taxes 1314 into 1415 shows anything other than the growth in taxes within Scotland. So I don't know particularly what point Mr uh, Rennie was making in that respect. Now, in the, the, the heart of this debate is about how we use or how we obtain the economic powers that enable us to strengthen and improve Scotland's economic performance. And that's what this debate is about. And we've demonstrated, I demonstrated in my speech earlier on, a number of examples where, by exercising our devolved responsibilities, we've increased exports, we've improved research and development spending, and we've improved, improved Scottish productivity by, six, by, by moving it from 6% lower than the UK to almost at the same level of the UK. So by having distinctive and different levers of policy in Scotland, we can deliver better outcomes and better performance. And the proposition of the Scottish Government is that we can do that to a greater extent with a fuller range of powers and responsibilities. Um, OK, I'll give way to Mr. Chairman Brown. Grateful to him, forgive me. He has published a partial analysis. Will he commit today in the Chamber to the Scottish Government publishing a full analysis of projections for full fiscal autonomy? Well, what I, what I said is that we will we'll publish the oil and gas bulletin, which is exactly what Mr Rennie asked us to do, and that's what the First Minister has made clear. Now, let me... Let me let me make a, a final point about the, the nature of the analysis that we're talking about here and the debate that we're having. 
The, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, and I used this quote earlier on, indicated that full fiscal autonomy would give freedom to pursue different and perhaps better fiscal policy and to undertake the radical, politically challenging reforms that could generate additional growth. There are undoubtedly areas where existing UK policy could be improved upon. None of the miserable analysis provided by the Conservative Party or the Liberal Party uh, sorry, the Liberal Party or the Labour Party in this year. No, I think I've got to. I think I've got to draw my remarks to a close. You want? Uh, I'm very generous at giving. Well, you can. Well, you can. Oh, certainly, I will. Yes, of course. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking an intervention? Um, he's keen to quote the IFS. Does he also, therefore, understand that the IFS is saying that the cost of full fiscal autonomy this year is £7.6 billion? £7.6 billion. John Does he agree with that figure? Minute. Yes or no? There's, 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 there's two issues with what Jackie Bailey. Well, there's two points that Jackie Bailey has got to take into account. The first, is, the first is that in 2015-16, Scotland will not have fiscal autonomy. That is, that is, that is the reality of the situation. And the second is that the IFS analysis is predicated on making absolutely no judgment other than saying if you have wider financial levers at your disposal, you can deliver better economic performance. And I'm prepared to rest the case on the talent and the capability of the people of Scotland to do better than the miserable unionist bunch have ever done in running our economy. Many thanks. I now call on Murder Fraser to wind up. Mr Fraser, you have until five o'clock. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, I need to start my contribution with a confession. This is for the benefit of Mark Macdonald. In 1998, I co-authored, along with Michael Fry and Peter Smale, a pamphlet for the Tuesday Club called Full Fiscal Freedom for the Scottish Parliament. It was written long before this Parliament was even constituted. It was written so long ago, I can't even remember how much pink champagne we drank in the process <laughs> of writing it. Although knowing Michael Fry, it was probably quite a lot. But I came to the conclusion many years ago that full fiscal autonomy is not the best way for Scotland to go, and that's for two reasons. First of all, the version of full fiscal autonomy proposed by the SNP, which as far as I know, is that all tax revenues are collected by this Parliament, that we fund all spending in Scotland, and we pay a sum to Westminster for the very minor reserved items that would be uh, there that they wish to see, such as defence and foreign affairs simply does not exist as a model anywhere on this planet. The closest example is the Basque country in Spain, but even there, there is an element of control of tax levels from Madrid. And there's very good reason why there is no precedent, and that is that such a system is simply unworkable. In any constitutional arrangement, in any country, there should be a sharing and pooling of resource. And Ian Gray uh, made this point earlier. So the stronger parts of the country help the weaker, and in bad times, the richer areas can help the poorer. And this concept of pooling and sharing resource underpins the financial arrangements in devolved and federal countries across the world, which is why we have bodies such as the Australian Grants Commission operating within the federal system in Australia to reallocate resources from the richer areas to the poorer. There is no federal country in the world operating full fiscal autonomy as proposed by the SNP. It is not a workable proposition, simply a route to independence by a different name. And of course, there is a second reason why full fiscal autonomy makes no sense, and that is because of the fiscal gap that would be created. Now, the analysis from the Institute for Fiscal Studies shows this would be £7.6 billion by 2015-16, a gap that would need to be filled by borrowing, tax increases, cuts in spending, or a combination of all three. And we have heard nothing in the course of this debate for the last two hours and 20 minutes from the SNP as to how that gap would be filled. I exempt only from that John Mason, who at least made a brave, and it was a brave, attempt to explain it by claiming we could have full fiscal autonomy but also keep the Barnett formula which is arguing for two opposite outcomes at once. Mr Mason is called full fiscal autonomy for a reason. The clue is in the word fool. <laughs> Believe me, I know what it means. I once wrote a pamphlet about it. Now, as set out in Gavin Brown's motion today, there's no doubt that would be immensely damaging for the Scottish economy. But what we are calling for today is simply a set of modest proposals, as Willie Rennie confirmed. All we're asking is for the Scottish Government to update its projections for the public finances to reflect their current policy 
asking them to publish an updated oil and gas analytical bulletin and asking that the Scottish Fiscal Commission, supposedly a body independent of government, do the necessary work. Oh, yes, delighted to give way to Mr Mackenzie. Mr Mackenzie. I thank the member for taking the intervention. I wonder if he shares my disappointment that we're almost at the end of a debate entitled Scotland's Economy and Finances, and we haven't heard one positive thing from the UK party about Scotland's economy or what their hopes or plans for that and improving that might be. Mr Mackenzie, the UK economy is projected to be the fastest growing economy in the Western world in the years to come. What could be more positive than that? And you want to take us away from that. But I'm disappointed to see the SNP and Mr Swinney rejecting our modest calls this afternoon because the SNP will be standing candidates for election in just five weeks' time on a platform supporting full fiscal autonomy. Surely the people have a right to know what this means. Why should the Scottish Government be so reticent in bringing forward the detail on their policy? You would think they'd be keen to publish it yeah. so the people can be well informed, yet they seem strangely reluctant to talk about its consequences. Now, the SNP's proposition seems to be, well, we can grow our way out of the fiscal deficit by growing our economy faster, even faster than the UK economy is projected to grow uh, over the coming years. That will be growing uh, some. But if they want to do that, it would help if they set out exactly what policies they intend to follow to deliver that dramatic level of economic growth. Until a few weeks ago, it was clear what the flagship SNP policy was. The way to grow the economy, they told us, was to attract more large companies to invest in Scotland, and the way to do that was cut corporation tax by three pence in the pound. And all the way through the refer referendum campaign, I can remember all the debates I had with Mr Swinney and others, where this policy was paraded as the panacea to all our economic ills. Now, of course, it has been quietly shelved. Under the stewardship of Nicola Sturgeon, there will be no more sweeteners to large multinational companies. Amazon and Google will have to take their corporate headquarters elsewhere. And what is to replace this measure? What exactly is being proposed to deliver this miraculous level of economic growth? How will we raise the extra money to fill the 7.6 billion fiscal gap? We are still on tenterhooks awaiting that announcement. When I intervened on Mr Swinney earlier, he promised to come back and tell me how he was going to fill that gap, and we are still uh, waiting. Now, it's no wonder this is a policy the SNP don't want to talk about. Malcolm Chisholm was right. In the SNP conference speech from Nicola Sturgeon at the weekend, there was no mention of full fiscal autonomy. But she didn't get off the hook when she was on Good Morning Scotland yesterday. She said this, I would want to see Scotland moving to a position of fiscal autonomy. That's not going to happen overnight. That will happen over a period of time. We can picture the protest marches now the mass ranks of the SNP down Whitehall with their placards. What do we want? Full fiscal autonomy. When do we want it? Not now. If Mike, if Mike McKenzie's there, presiding officer, when do we want it? In six years' time. That's not going to capture the public imagination. And this is the party that told us we could be independent, a fully independent country, in 18 months' time and yet it will take six long years to deliver fiscal autonomy. <laughs> the fact is, the SNP are all over the place on this issue. How do we know they are in trouble? At one point this afternoon, Mr Swinney has to be, had to be bolstered on the front bench by no fewer than four ministerial colleagues. I've never seen a situation in this chamber before where there are more people on the SNP front bench than there were backbenchers <laughs> sitting behind him. Just as well they weren't all asked to make a speech in this debate, we probably would have got five different contributions. It shows just how weak Mr Swinney's position is on this particular issue. But why don't they publish that analysis? If they think their position is so strong, why don't they publish analysis showing the effect on the Scottish oh, economy and the public finances? They won't even let their placement in the Scottish Fiscal Commission do the necessary work. Realising the negative impact of full fiscal autonomy, this is a policy they don't want to talk about. Yes, I'll give way to Mr Macdonald. Mark Macdonald. I thank Mr Fraser for giving way. At least one of us has managed to leave the University Debating Society behind, but perhaps he can advise whether... Perhaps Order. Mr Fraser can advise whether Let's he considers... Mr. 
whether he considers that the UK uh, macroeconomic framework, if his prognosis for the Scottish economy is correct, has been good or bad for Scotland? Well, I think I only heard, I only heard part of that, I'm afraid, such was the hilarity around me of uh, Mr Macdonald's uh, contribution. But he cannot deny the fact that the UK economy under a Conservative government is growing strongly at the moment. Scotland has benefited from that growth and we should not put that at risk. Presiding officer, we have an election coming up on May the 7th. <laughs> Despite all the manoeuvring, all the backpedalling and all the shilly-shallying around on this issue, a vote for SNP candidates in that election is a vote for full fiscal autonomy, is a vote to create a black hole in the public finances of £7.6 billion per annum. We know that the SNP won't do a deal with the Conservatives. We know they're only interested in propping up a Miliband government with a Labour leader so weak he will have to give in to their every demand in order to get the keys to Downing Street. That would be a disaster for Britain and an even greater disaster for Scotland. It's only the Conservatives who have the strength to stand up against the combined forces of Labour and the SNP and the danger they present to the Scottish public finances and Scottish taxpayers. Order. Presiding officer, let me just say this in closing. Order. Let me just say this in closing, presiding officer. Our proposals this afternoon, if you read Gavin Brown's motion, are modest and reasonable. Who could be more modest and reasonable than Mr Brown? We are not in our motion condemning full fiscal autonomy. We are not denouncing his advocates. We are calling for something that's very simple, publication of some research. Not one SNP speaker in the course of this afternoon addressed the key point in Gavin Brown's motion. Not one argument was heard against publication of the information requested. And even now, in my closing seconds, I appeal to the good grace to all the reasonable people in the SNP backbenches, give the Scottish people the information they need. Just what are you afraid of? That concludes the debate on Scotland's economy and finances. Point of order for Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful, Presiding Officer. It is a point of order, but for a change, you won't be asked who was right and who was wrong in today's debate. Uh, I was uh, grateful, as I'm sure other members were, for a copy of the text of your speech to the David Hume Institute this week on the subject of parliamentary reform. I think a great many members across the chamber and many people outside of this parliament as well recognise that we need to do scrutiny better in this parliament and that you are right to raise the, the issue of reform. At whatever pace this debate continues, though, and in whatever direction it goes, and there'll be a range of views about that, I believe it's important to be subject to some degree of public and transparent scrutiny. Motions, I know, may be discussed and the subject may be discussed at the Parliamentary Bureau, but the Bureau, of course, does not meet in public or on the record. Can I ask you, Presiding Officer, what process you have in mind for some public and transparent debate uh, on this matter, one which includes all members and includes others who have an interest in the quality of the scrutiny that this Parliament provides? Can I firstly thank Patrick Harvey for advance notice of his point of order. As the member will have noted from my speech I set out on Monday, that was my personal view on changes that I think we could make. Today I have had discussions with the conveners group and business managers and colleagues from across the parliament. At this stage, I am seeking views of all members and ideas, and I would very much welcome input from Mr. Harvey or any other colleagues. My office is available at all times. Can we now move on to decision time? The next item of business is consideration of business motion 12884 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Can I ask any member who wish to speak against the motion to press the request to speak button now and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12884. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is, the motion number 12884 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed to are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 12882 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau 
setting out a revised time to go for the assisted suicide Scotland Bill at stage one. Any member who wishes to speak against motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12882. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 12882, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are well agreed. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 12883, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a stage one timetable for the smoking prohibition children and motor vehicle Scotland Bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12883. Moved. No member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is, the motion number 12883, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion numbers 12885 and 12886 on the May Day holiday and the Spring Bank holiday. Moved on block. The question on these motions will be put to decision time, to which we now come. There are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 12857.2 in the name of John Swinney, which seeks to amend motion number 12857 in the name of Gavin Brown on Scotland's economy and finances be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12857.2 in the name of John Swinney is as follows. Yes, 63. No, 41. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 12857.1 in the name of Jackie Bailey, which seeks to amend motion number 12857 in the name of Gavin Brown on Scotland's economy and finances be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is not agreed to. We move to vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12857.1 in the name of Jackie Bailey is as follows. Yes, 23. No, 81. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12857 in the name of Gavin Brown as amended on Scotland's economy and finances be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12857 in the name of Gavin Brown is amended is as follows. Yes, 64. No, 40. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12885 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick 
on the May Day holiday be agreed to? Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 1286, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on the Springbank Hall to be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly. Right, okay.